Fuck me. All right, let's do this now. Um, ex-Muslim is about to go in. Um, he's about to tear off my head. So let's get it. Right. So yesterday you read from the Hermitica, and without a shadow of a doubt, it had some very strong Christian language. And you that, that followed the Kemetic philosophy made the claim that um, this text influenced early Christian thought. However, let me read to you. Stop! 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 That's already that's a ready, that's a ready false. Ready force, ready force. So you didn't say comedic philo philosophy influenced Christianity. Comedic, yes, comedic, comedic culture, and therefore philosophy influence Judeo Christianity. Okay, so why did you put me off? That's exactly what I just said. Right. Anyways, no, no, Hermetica is not um, the. How can I put it? Hermetica is not equivalent to comedic philosophy. Is Hermetica part of the Kemetic um, literature? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Let, but can we I never made the hold, stop. Stop. I'm just make, this is just check it now. We never made the claim that the Hermetica influenced, okay, influenced or or done anything like that towards Christian literature. Okay, but that you said, happened. but you said Kemetic philosophy influenced Christianity, and you quoted from the Hermetica in order to prove your case. No. So you didn't no. do that? No, oh. never. Well, okay then. Go, let's watch the debate from yesterday. I'm pretty sure you did that. No. We said comedic philosophy. I remember making mention of the culture. And we started talking about how if you go through your Bible, you will see that they even make mention of it and so forth. But you but did not. The, Hermet the Hermetica is a later text. A later text. Okay, okay? So, so the Hermetica text did not influence Christianity. We've never made that claim, no. So you didn't make that claim yesterday? No, because <laughs> from the beginning, that that's why we said you got to read the beginning, because from the beginning, so, so all the brother did... Kalam did, hold on, from the beginning, all Kalam, all the brother Kalam did at the beginning of the show was saying that, listen, we're going to be delving into the Hermetica. For those who don't know about the book, the Hermetica, we're going to be delving into it and, and, and reading the first few you know, first few pages. That was it. It was no okay. What we're reading today is gonna we're gonna be showing you from the Hermetica that this is this is what influenced early Christian. No, that wasn't even said. The only the only time Christianity and all this stuff got involved in the show was when you came on and started saying stuff about oh hold on this Christianity and then we started talking about that. But from the beginning, all Kalam did was just go through um the first few pages and just and just read. But during him reading, I was reading things from the Bible saying, hmm, it, I can get kind of the same things from this. I get kind of the same vibes from this. You see what I'm saying? That's why we said, take, this is why I told you, ex-Muslim, take time. Don't just, the Listen, show was only just done a couple of hours ago. Relax. <laughs> ex-Muslim, I'll give you some homework. Go and read the book of Ezra. And then you see what influence Christi Christianity. Go oh. read the book of Ezra. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that's mine. All right. But go ahead anyway. Like you know, yeah, but go ahead. Though, okay. Even though you, even though you, it's gonna be like a dead claim, but go ahead, man. I'm, I'm still okay. I'm still okay. curious to hear what you got to say. Would you accept that um, Christianity might have influenced the Hermetica? Um, I would say that Christianity. Um, all right, technically speaking, mm -hmm. let's put it like this. The Gnostics, okay, for example, you have the Nag Hammadi um, scriptures, okay? And in the Nag Hammadi scriptures, you do find, um, you do find, what do you find? You do find a certain hermetic uh, text within inside of their library itself. So we could see that there is an exchange of information between the um, hermetic literature and the Gnostic Christians. So therefore, there is a lot of um, cross-pollination between the two communities at that time. Right. Okay. So Christians were utilizing the Hermetic text, yes. Yo. Yo. I don't know if they can hear me on this, man. Yeah, we can hear you, B. Oh, oh all right. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> all right, let me mute you out then. I'll mute you out just in case. You might be doing something. Yeah, I'd right. say. So, go ahead, ex-Muslim. So I was just going to quote from this book where a couple of scholars have said for, and they gave a variety number of reasons of um, 
and they're battling the claim that uh, the Hermetica influenced Christianity and they're making the claim no it was the other way around simply for the fact that you have the likes of Philo of Alexandria and also the Gospel of John which come from the first century and the Hermetica come from the second to third century so they're saying that it was the Hermetica that was influenced by Christian thought that's all I wanted to say okay you mean Jewish thought rather than Christian thought I'm saying Judeo I'm saying Judeo Christian thought okay and what about um what about whatever philo and john was saying that is um seems as though it's influencing it so philo of alexandria talked about the word and the word being separate from the being of god and then you have in the gospel of john um also this uh in the first chapter talks about the word as well and also describes certain characteristics of the father and the son and the son being light from light and things like that and um, and so the hermitica text could have been i'm not saying it has been but it could have been influenced by early christian texts okay okay I should really bring out some. I should really bring out some Martin Bernal, yeah, to actually show you some stuff. Um, but actually, you lot carry on. You lot carry on. I'll, I'll just bring out some stuff here real quickly just to show you afterwards. Go on. You lot carry on, man. You lot talk, and then I'm gonna bring out some stuff for you. Baza, I want to ask you a question if you're there. Uh, yeah, bro. I just, I just come back, bro. What are you saying, bro? You're right. Yeah, I'm good, man. Have you heard of um, Imam Tawhidi? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of him still. What do you yeah, think yeah. of him? Imam Tawhidi, he's a. Uh, I feel like a lot, of, some of, a lot of the stuff that he says, obviously, I do agree with. However, I feel like he's got like a little political agenda in mind. Right. I feel like some of the stuff that he says, he just says it for the sake. Like he doesn't really believe in it. He just says it to make Australia happy. If you get what I mean. Right. Okay. So you don't think uh, he's an intimate Shia uh, voice? Nah, it's yeah. scholars generally scholars, scholars generally don't they kind of all run away from him because they all kind of see him as a bit of a loose cannon. <laughs> right. Um he's um like obviously so, like some of the stuff that he's good in is vocal. He will openly things speak about certain things that other scholars want, which is good. However, there are de definitely certain things where he, he does go overboard at times if you watch his videos and I know recently he met Tommy Robinson, didn't he? Yeah, in his um dip in his uh, talk with Tommy Robinson. He talked yeah, what about did he do? How how he loved the prophet's grandson and how the only reason he remains a muslim is because of hussein and uh wow, it's a very wow, interesting wow. talk so i just thought wow 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 no, hey, no listen i, I, I want to get mirza's point of view on uh john before you move on to this topic because you mentioned the book of john yeah i want to get what mirza thinks about uh john because i think i know the yazidis hold john in a high esteem do we have a yazidi on the panel Yeah, yeah. Mirza's a Yazidi. Wow. So where's Mirza gone? Uh, maybe he's busy. Yeah, it looks like looks like it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So um yeah, when when uh when um Zaria, when when Shola, when he comes back, um obviously I'll, I'll let him take that question. Uh back to what you were just saying, um brother, brother ex Muslim and proud, I, I wanna stop calling you that man, ex Muslim and proud. Tell me your name. <laughs> My name is Ruslan, R U S L A N. Ruslan, there you go, that's it. Every time I call you ex Muslim and proud. <laughs> as, uh, yeah, brother Ruslan, as you were saying to no uh, Sheikh Tawhid, your um a lot obviously a lot he's obviously got the Shia theology theological background. However, in terms of all his political views or generally his methodology where he does sometimes become a bit excessive on the Sunni brothers where, you know, sometimes I agree with disagree with them, but sometimes I do feel like he goes a bit too far and he's a bit, he bashes them a bit too much if you get what I mean. <laughs> yeah, bro, I was watching uh, the debate with Mohammed Hijab and Saeed El Shobari. Is that what's called? Oh, yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. Very yes. good debate. I've watched it maybe about two, three times. Wow. In that debate, <laughs> Saeed um, uses the Sunni narrative to prove that the Quran is corrupted and if the Shia were to go by the Sunni narrative of how the Quran was compiled and Uthman mm -hmm. burning the Quran and things like that, they could not possibly come to the conclusion that the Quran has been perfectly preserved. 
Yeah, in ter- I've watched that a bit a couple of times as well, you know. You know what it is? I'll tell you what it is, yeah. I thought um, he was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, the thing is, in the, in, in that discussion and stuff, um, it gets a bit hyped. I don't know if you noticed, but Mohamed Ajab is quite wild, quite hyped up in that debate, yeah, if you know it. Yeah, yeah. He's quite hyped up in that debate. You know what it is, um, brother, yeah? You know, like... Generally, there's always this discussion in, in Shia Sunni polemics about Sunni saying, oh, the Shias, you don't believe in the Quran, etc. And you have these hadith in your book. But the thing is, according to the hadith books, if you really want to play that game, according to a lot of hadith sources from both sources, the Quran, it does, it does seem that the Quran has been tampered with according to hadith sources. So that's why we always say to the Sunni school, we always say, listen, if you want to go down that alley, then no one's Quran stays, no one's Quran remains preserved because both our narrations have problematic narrations about this regard are you with me yep no one can really survive the sword then because everyone's if everyone says oh no i believe the quran's perfect well everyone's got certain traditions or hadiths that are problematic that indicate the quran is indeed tampered with so however we obviously we don't believe that however like you said said shaberi what the point he was trying to make was that if you do want to play this game according to your own narrative it's very hard to believe the quran isn't tampered with just because of the whole story about the way Uthman done things and the way all the companions got together it's very problematic right so do you believe that Uthman did burn the different um versions of the quran and then he redacted it into one quran yeah so you see what you see with Uthman, yeah the general reading again Shia the scholars Shia themselves are divided yeah it's Shia narratives on, on on this issue itself is divided um but the the position that i follow within the Shia school is that what Uthman actually did was in Uthman's time a lot of you know I'm, I, I being ex-muslim you might know you know about this there's so many different recitations of the quran that you can do meaning different what you call different qiraat meaning different yeah, like the recitation and types the and all that. yeah exactly exactly these obviously still remain today however in Uthman's time they had become excessive so what Uthman done was he said I will now make one narrative so he never made the Quran rather what the Shia narrative is he basically unified the narrative of the recitation and said I'm going to make everyone recite one recitation rather than he compiled the Quran because we say generally according to a lot of Shia scholars they've they use this to kind of give Uthman this amazing status that he compiled the Quran but a lot of Shia scholars disagree with this because we say no in reality what he done was he just made the recitation one in his time and he localized it into the Qurayshi dialect um, and that's pretty much what he done yeah because there was a lot of non-Arabic speakers and so it was only right that they go back to the uh, um, original standardized Qurayshi dialect Quraishi like you dialect. said but exactly yeah. but strange, the thing is right Muslims say there are one Quran but if you actually study Islam there are a few modes of the Quran not not necessarily versions but modes I think that's the correct term to use well, and I... in the Sunni narrative they have a mechanism in um, explaining the different modes within Islam and they say all these different modes go back to, all the way back to the angel Gabriel and the prophet um, is that the same with the nah, Shia nah. Shia, the Shia narrative is not that <laughs> because uh, in reality obviously that's like a, a nice perfect picture they're painting uh, the dialect was really revealed on one because according to Shia according to Shia and Sunni tradition they say it was revealed and they had seven different recitations etc the Shia correct. narrative is it was revealed the Shia narrative is it was revealed in one dialect any other narratives that are coming to that, that are reaching us today are the difference of men meaning people have then started changing their dialects and they've got the different interpretations but really? in the way it was revealed was just one so is it just the wash quran you read basically yeah the most so you of, wouldn't uh, read hafs or uh, uh, duri or the other Qurans. I, i'll tell you something i'll, I'll tell you that the way the prophet's family dealt with this issue is we've got narrations in our books here uh, in shia traditions from the imams from the prophet's family they said that when they were asked about the different recitations they said listen there's only one recitation however Whatever is famous amongst the Muslims, we permit you to read according to them. So we're allowed to read it, but we do say that, listen, in reality, when Allah revealed it, there was only one recitation. In terms of all the recitations today, the, the, the Prophet's family said, listen, to make your life easy, you can recite it. However, there's only one true one. What that true one is, you're never going to really find out what that exact true one is. But what's, we just read what's famous, basically. Are you with me? Right. So you read the most popular one. Exactly, 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 exactly. The thing is, exactly. Raza, right? The Quran, Allah in the Quran makes a specific claim that He's going to protect the Quran from corruption. Am I correct? True, true, true. So every single word 
has been mm. protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? True, true. Right. So that means even if a single letter has been changed or put in, then we can mm. conclude that Allah has not preserved the Quran. If there's a single letter or word that's changed, yeah, fair enough, right. cool. So you need really a, a very high percentage of proof. So my question is, despite all the speculation that is around there, why mm. are you so... Um, how are you so confident that you have the Quran here uncorrupted when this is a major tenant of Islam and a lot of it seems like um, speculation? Like, where do you get that confidence from? Because, like I said, even if a single letter has been taken out, even like mm. I as a Christian don't have that standard for the Bible because nowhere does God in the New Testament say he's going to preserve every single letter here. So that even is, if yeah, the yeah. ending of Mark's gospel is lost or the adulterous woman in the gospel of john let's say that's um a forgery whatever i don't care that still does not like affect the christian truth however even if mm. one letter has been changed in the quran mm. that would be devastating for islam so where do you have that confidence that the quran has been perfectly preserved you see generally with the with the quran yeah like we you know in previous nations if you look at like with christianity judaism or other um, God revealed religions. There's always been this issue of God reveals the book and then afterwards the community or the successors or other people, external forces, they kind of corrupt the book. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. O over time. So what we say is, look, because Islam is the, now, according to Muslims, it's the last thing that God's going to reveal. He has to make it different because he's not going to send no one after. So what we say is the same issue that we, that previous communities have because there's a, there's a tradition that's attributed to our prophet, peace be upon him, that says everything that happened in previous nations will happen in my nation. So right. the prophet's making a statement that's saying whatever's happened there, now someone could argue and say, okay, but in previous nations, their books were corrupted. So we say the, ex the explanation of that is, is this, is that in previous nations, the books were corrupted. In our nation, the book won't be corrupted, but the thing that will be corrupted is the hadith. That's why the hadith, you have so many different types of hadith. You have hadith that are if you that clearly problematic that muslims can't and this is what the whole issue is where you've got a hadith in bukhari that says the prophet married someone who was six you've yeah. got a hadith in bukhari that but, says you know the prophet done x, x y z a lot of muslims will now stick onto those traditions but this is exactly what we try and say we say the corruptions did happen but allah might have protected the book but in terms of the actual thing that corrupt that got corrupted in our community it was definitely the hadith because if you look at hadith and you as an ex-muslim will probably know our hadith literature is it's all over the place. We've got we've got correct traditions, and it's only a man-made system. You know this whole system of is it sahih? You know, is the sunnah sahih? It's still a man-made system. You can never be a hundred percent with that system. You can only say I'm, a man's I'm wondering. I'm wondering how Ruslan adheres or kind of deals with Galatians two twelve, which represents Paul's account of um, the greatest turning points in Paul's life, right? right? Which is the moment in which he he gave up on Jesus's Jewish sect and set forth boldly into the future to to find his own new faith which was worshiping jesus himself which is in direct violation of judaism's first three of the ten commandments which is in exodus 22 to uh, 3 to 7 and uh, yeah, well, you, you, 5 7 to 11. Zeria, yeah, first, first of all i'll talk about that but that's completely irrelevant to what i want to ask raza raza and um, in uh imam tawhidi's yeah. um talk with uh um tommy robinson, robinson. He talked about Aisha's marriage and the reason yes. why the Sunnis have it at six and then consummation is at nine, nine. is yeah. because obviously Aisha is the mother of the believers, right? And mm -hmm. so they want to make her pure like the Virgin Mary. And mm -hmm. for a woman to be pure, she has to be a virgin. Therefore, the Sunnis pushed the date of Aisha right into her childhood in order to make her like pure. Um, would you? I thought that was a very interesting thing he said. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'll tell you what. It, I'll tell you what it is. Look, people when they um when people fabricated traditions in the books of in the books of hadith. And remember, these uh, this is not a, a definitely issue with Sunnism. Even Shiism is not free from it. Shiism has a lot of fabricated literature in the hadith literature. We all suffer from this issue. The only difference is that we're basically. Where we're, we're, we're academic enough to accept it, where Sunnis basically come to Bukhari. In terms of the in terms of the answer to your question, I would hundred percent agree with that view that 
it was definitely forwarded this view that Aisha is very young. It was it was basically narrated by someone who wanted to push the agenda that look, oh, you know, how can any other wife be better than Aisha? She was the youngest, and obviously, youngest means that she hasn't been married before, and then naturally it leads to the most purest. And it was like a a very you know a, a, a simple minded concept that they tried to push on, but in reality. If you look at the 21st century now, it, it makes our prophet look bad. And this is what we say. We say, listen, you think it's actually a praise. It's not a praise. It's actually a bad thing because any man that will read that will be like, what is going on? And this is why a lot of non-Muslims literally pick on this issue because we, it's anyone that wants to hear, you know, the prophet was an elderly person who married someone that was six or nine. It just doesn't sit right. And no one with common sense will agree with it. And this exactly what this is the reason it was pushed. Exactly yes. what, uh, what you've just mentioned. They pushed it for this reason. I was 18. Say that again. Yeah, she, she was. She Michael was. Yeah. Uh, and how come? What, um, I, I just recommend people to watch um, the video Sar Saracen made with Mufti Abu Lays. Yeah. It to, to our video. It's just, uh, we don't want to um, just derail the show, I think. Um, point two is you mentioned the debate between the Shia cleric, Sayyid Ali Shuberi, with Muhammad Hijab. Uh, without going into the actual content of the debate, I'd just like to point out the actual energy each person exude, um, exuded. The cleric was very professional, calm, um, should I say coherent, whereas Muhammad Hijab came like a, as if he was somebody and started screaming. I think that was just enough proof to say he was right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was I'm, I'm just wondering whether we actually derailing from the topic or not, whether Kalam wants to address. Um, it looks like Kalam. I need to stop running. <laughs> Kalam, you, you, you want us to carry on just doing our free mixing or you want to, uh, it's your show, bro. If you're happy to ask for free mix, you tell me, bro. Um, Let me quickly check the comment section. Let me check the comment section and see what the family's actually saying. Yeah, buddy. Well, it's really good, family. Um, I'm literally going to just quickly check to see what you guys have to say. Um, Of course, all you have to do is literally tag Titans TV. I see answers in the building. Naz Shah is in the building as well. Indian Singh, of course, 3D Worldwide, The Beast of the Streets, uh, Patrick Park. I'm just quickly checking to see what you're going to say. Um, Unfortunately, there's a lot of things going on, and I can't zoom in into anything right now unless you tag Titans TV. Um, X Muslim looks like. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, good show. Good show, they're saying. So they're commenting on X Muslim. They're saying, X Muslim, do you know Raj? It looks like you two <laughs> might, might have some type of connection going on. <laughs> um, okay, academic screeching, Titans TV, bro. Can I debate <laughs> Titans? Uh, brother, need f needy Friday a formal debate. Um, email me, email me, and we'll have this conversation um, afterwards. All right. Uh, the link don't work. Send a new one. Unfortunately, I can't send a new one. Is because the whole panel is filled up right now. So um, I'm gonna go where the community wants us to go. Let me just check. How long have we actually been on? Okay, saying we've been on for two hours. But okay, um, where do you want to go, Ruslan? You're gonna stop running. You're gonna address what I asked you. Oh, the, oh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that um um Roslan is or ex Muslim. That's what I'm gonna call him. Ex Muslim is um yeah. is he definitely um is he finished with the whole comedic stuff before we move on? Because I can see the, obviously the topic diverted. So yes. I just want to make sure that he's satisfied because I remember I saw last night. He was. He went straight onto the chat and was, you know, he was spewing a lot of stuff. So I should have <laughs> made sure that he's all right, or is he going to go home, um, do some research, and maybe we we'll pick up this topic again. I'm already or... at home. Huh? I'm already <laughs> in my home. That's good. We'll go to the deeper home, which is the deeper, the deeper cocoon, <laughs> and do some research, <laughs> and then come back again. I don't know. Ready, it just yeah? feels like you're constantly shifting the goalpost, but it's all right. Huh? <laughs> 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 Okay, let me know what you want to do. Let, let us know what you want to do, Expo. If you want to, I, 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 I got Zariab's been out. Zariab, what did you want to say, bro? All right, I was sticking on him because we were supposed to have a debate from a long time, but he just he hasn't been, yeah. And I did so debate you on this it, topic. I'm gonna bring lost. it up on the, I'm gonna bring it up on the top, and I'll bring it up on the panel now, isn't it? which is basically surrounding the topic of Galatians 2 12, yeah. which represents Paul's account of the greatest turning point 
in Paul's writings, yeah. So as a as a Christian, Ruslan needs to be answering this because this is the point. Where, I will, I will, this is the point where will, this is the point where I will there, was defend the there was a diversion from Jesus's <laughs> Jewish sect, right? And there was the creation yeah. of a new faith, which was worshiping Jesus Himself in direct violation of the first three commandments of Judaism. First no, being not having any other gods, no, such as the sun. We don't the have second any being other gods. against we making Yahweh. images of God. We and don't the have third images. one against bowing in prayer before such gods. So, okay, the gross violation, as I say, is is there for, for it to be seen. But I'm interested to see how he explains two twelve. But then we can take it further from there. Okay, cool, brother Oscan. So again, this is a very um, Muslim thing to do: is trying to get a, a rift between the Apostle Paul and the other apostles. If you go to Galatians chapter 1, just one chapter prior to that. I'll go on to chapter 2, don't worry. Go on to Galatians 1. Go. I think it's verse... 1 and 3 and 4. That was a two-part God, but then you're going to have to explain how it developed into a trinity. But yeah, go on. Uh, right, so it says here, um, verse... Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. What to happened to 1, 2, 3, and 4? No. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. So we know that the Apostle Paul had direct communication with Jesus' best friend, Peter, and also his biological half-brother, James. And he was in good terms with them. So let me ask you the question. If Paul invented this new religion of worshipping Jesus and they and he violated what the disciples believed in, why did the disciples accept him into his home? And in, if you read Acts chapter 15, the Apostle James and the Apostle Peter both called the Apostle Paul our beloved friend. Also, when you go to... Um, Acts 16, I think, when people were thrown allegations against the Apostle Paul, both the Apostle James and the Apostle uh, Peter both defended the honor of the Apostle Paul. So if Paul was teaching this blasphemous claim that God became man and died for the sins of mankind and Jesus' disciples who knew Jesus directly, who ate, slept, uh, uh, drank, they knew Jesus. They were his friends. They were his friends for three years, his 12 disciples. Why did they why did they accept the Apostle Paul and call him our beloved friend? And why did they not rebuke him and say, how dare you um, say this? We are Muslims. We worship Allah. Uh, you should not be associating Jesus partners alongside with Allah himself. But they never said that. Why? Because they accepted the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Oh, all right. So. What we're gonna do is get straight into the into the meat, yeah. We're gonna get straight into the meat. <laughs> all right, all right, cool. So the point <laughs> is that this is a development, and this is my claim that Paul developed this idea, this this triune, uh, aside and away from James, who was the bishop of Jerusalem, who was the leader of the flock, so to speak. And seeing as you don't want to deal with Galatians one. One and three and four. No, because... We'll go straight. We'll not... Listen, you talked. Relax. We'll go straight to <laughs> Galatians two twelve, because this is the interesting aspect of Peter, who you mentioned, and Paul, who you mentioned. So in in Galatians two twelve, we see Peter was really afraid of the agents uh, that were sent by James, right? Because they were Jews. Right. And uh, secondly, because they were advocating circumcision. Remember at this point that the covenant marked in blood with Abraham in Genesis is uh, signed and sealed with with uh, with blood and circumcision. Right. So this is a Judaic concept. And naturally, this is what James was pushing for. Uh, if we see the context and you'll find that in Galatians 2. Two, uh, chapter 2 verse 3 and Galatians 3 uh, verse 6 to, t uh, 6 to 10 and uh, Galatians 5 2 to 7 
Acts 15, 1 to 3, and Acts 15 to 19, uh, Acts 15, verse 19, it, the, all of these quotes indicate quite clearly that the proponents of circumcisions, right, not Jews themselves, but the proponents of circumcision were Paul's adversaries in this climactic incident. Because because this this pali pali situation that you're trying to present was not the actual reality. Paul mm-hmm. in in Galatians two twelve very skillfully avoided employing words which uh, made clear what the meaning was, and this is what's provided scholars and uh, researchers like yourself with with um, the opportunity of of avoiding to de- avoiding dealing with this unpleasant reality. Okay. If we follow Paul's account in Galatians 2.10, the Jerusalem sect of Jesus' followers demanded of Paul not only that he keep in mind the poor among their Jerusalem community, not that Paul's people who were Gentiles adhered to any of the laws of the covenant, nor did they adhere to the dietary laws, nor did they adhere to the circumcision laws, nor to any other, uh, but rather on the basis of uh, Acts 15 to 29, the only requirements were to adhere to the dietary and sexual laws. And this is what was being uh, reminded to Paul. Uh, and, 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 and Peter was called a, a hypocrite by, by Paul. But the point is that Paul was just, w- was just scared, right? He was scared. of, But that will be, that will be explored later on. Uh, like I say, if you look at both accounts in, in Galatians 2.10 and Acts 15.29, right, the table fellowship, this is what I'm talking about, the table fellowship, right, at, at the unkosher mill is what was being violated by Peter. And that's what he was being reprimanded by for. But this is just the common interpretation, but it really doesn't make any sense because this is the question now. If Peter was being caught uh, dining at an unkosher table, then that wouldn't have been violating Galatians 2 and 10. There would have been, according to Paul's account, there no issue whatsoever in uh, two, uh, Galatians two to 12, uh, twelve, rather. But clearly, there was an issue, and furthermore, the only violation of Acts fifteen twenty nine would have been that Paul and not Peter would have been violating his promise to James to impose the kosher laws upon his followers. But in that case, Paul's charge of Peter's cowardice, right? And this is what I was talking about, that he was shook, that there was trying to claim that Peter was shook in Galatians 2 to, in 13, with Galatians 2 verse 13, it wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't even be an issue, but for, quote unquote, Peter's cowardice. And I'm saying cowardice because that's what's in the text. But obviously that cowardice was an issue to Paul. So how do we unfurl this? How do we kind of explore this? I'll give it back to you. So, so let me get this. Are you trying to say that according to Peter and to James, that you needed to be circumcised and stick to the dietary requirements of the Old Testament? According to James, the only requirements for the Gentile community, which Paul was, was uh, uh, preaching to, was to keep the dietary and sexual laws. Is Is... What about circumcision? Uh, now, this is very interesting, but I think I'll, I'll leave that. I'll leave that. But deal with the first two first. So are you talking about their relationship with the dietary requirements? I think I've made it pretty clear. Deal, deal with it. I don't understand your question. Can you just put your question into one nice uh, sentence, please? Well, firstly, I'm taking away the image that you presented, which was that it was all happy pali, pali wali, and everyone was cool with each other. Evidently, that's not the case if you follow the quotes that I, I gave you. So Galatians chapter 2 is talking about basically... Um, we don't need basics. If you're going <laughs> to quote it, just read it. So, Yo, after this, can I ask ex Muslim a question? Can I just finish this and then you can? All right. All right. So basically, the Apostle Peter made a mistake because he gave the um, instructions that, um, that, the, uh, that the new 
Gentile converts no longer need to be circumcised, and he accepted this. But afterwards, he got influenced by other Jewish Christians, and then he stopped sitting with the non-circumcised Christians. And the Apostle Paul came up to him and rebuked him to his face. And then the Apostle Peter um, knew that he did what was wrong. And then it was all hunky-dory. I don't see your point. Because you have to understand that Peter, James, they all come from this devout Jewish um, religion, right? So it took a bit of time for them to adjust to all to the new covenant. So they could have been very easily influenced by other Jewish Christians who said, no, in order for you to enter the covenant of Christ, you have to be, first of all, circumcised. And initially, James and John... Uh, I mean, James and Peter both said, no, you don't have to be circumcised. But after they got influenced by the Jewish Christians and the Apostle Paul came to Peter and rebuked him to his face. And then Peter obviously apologized. And if you read, for example, Second Peter, the Apostle Peter talks about Paul's writings as scripture. So, again, the Apostle Peter um, accepted the Apostle Paul because you have to remember the Apostle Paul was really like the first scholar of the of Christianity. He was the one who knew what he was talking about. As opposed to the brother of Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to say and I'm going to state very clearly that the only explanation that makes sense under uh, either scenario that's set out in Galatians 2.10 or Acts 15.29 is that the issue between Paul and Peter was that Peter was caught by James's representative, representatives rather, because there was a few of them. He was caught dining with uncircumcised men. Now, this is the thing that you don't understand as a follower of quote unquote Christianity. Okay, don't be patronizing, please. <laughs> this is the thing that you don't understand as a quote unquote Christian. Yeah, patronizing as hell. James. James was a Jew in the sense that he followed the Judaic covenant. Now, that cannot be argued because that's historical fact. Now, the issue here, as I say, in the Galatians 2.10 or Acts 15.29 can only be understood that in the sense that Peter was caught by James's representatives. And this should tell you something. that Obviously, James was the head of the church, right? Dining, he was dining with uncircumcised men. This is because James had changed his mind immediately following the council and sent Peter and then other, those other representatives to follow him up to demand that Paul finally impose circumcision. And that Paul now, in the situation in Galatians 2.10 or Acts 15.29, right, he was shocked, Paul was shocked to see Peter side with James against Paul. Now, the thing is, Peter had, you're right, just a few days earlier, defended Paul, right? According to Acts 15, uh, verse 7 to 11. The only thing, though, that Paul has told us about James's men is that they were, quote unquote, the party of circumcision. So, over to you. Okay. Let's go to Acts 15. This was the first decree made by the Christian church, right? In Acts chapter 15, <clears throat> then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Peter got up and addressed them. And basically, to cut the long story short, he says, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And then immediately James got up and he started talking about the same thing. So Peter and James both agreed that circumcision was no longer necessary in line with Paul's teachings as well. So both Paul, James and Peter were all unanimously agreed on. However, afterwards, the Jewish Christians who were um, devout monotheistic Jews had a problem with this. They, if they found it hard to break, it, break away from their culture. And so did Peter. And they managed to influence Peter. Then the Apostle Paul came and it says in Galatians 2 that he rebuked him 
let me read this. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Why? Because he did not sit with the circumcised. And so the apostle Peter knew that he did wrong and then everything was fine. I don't see why you're trying to, if anything, if uh, the Quran says that Jesus' disciples were Muslim, but if they were Muslim, why did they say that, for example, they did not make a warning? Why you can't eat pork? And they said, oh, you must be circumcised. But we don't see anything because for, of the simple fact that there is no evidence that Jesus' disciples were the Muslims in the historic understanding of Islam. Okay. So it's interesting you keep going to Islam, but I'm not mentioning that at all. We're keeping it strictly within the context of, of, uh, of Judeo-Christian scripture. So Yo. To, further, to further on my argument, we see... We see in um, the fact that James changed his mind. Okay, so in look the entire the, see the, the entire kind of chaos right that was precipitated by the arrival of James's men in uh, Galatians two and twelve right it was because James had sent first as his representative to Paul Peter in in Galatians two and eleven. This, is, was, this was the beginning of the confrontation with Paul. Why was Peter selected by James? James uh, Peter was selected by James because Peter was Paul's own mentor and his senior in the Gentile mission. right? But obviously and evidently, Peter was too meek and evidently didn't press the issue, the circumcision issue. This is, however, we can kind of only speculate, but perhaps he was too too soft for such a hard assignment. But in any case, James had, for, had foreseen this and as such sent the backup team to verify Peter's work and Peter's enforcement of the changed order from James, right? Now, if we have that as a framework, now we can understand Galatians 2 and 12. Not only was Peter called, caught red-handed violating James's instruction to him by his evidently not uh standing firm sorry what was what was james's instruction to paul Hold on. i'm gonna get there just have some patience not only does uh, uh peter's backing away from the table in 212 make sense now uh because not only did peter violate james's instructions but he didn't st stand firm in the presentation in his presentation to paul uh, that he was given, or the, or the message that he was given by James to Paul and his men, right? Um, but this it goes even further than that. Peter was even uh, violating, violating um, God's will, if you will. This is the principle that's set forth in Exodus chapter or Exodus twelve verses forty eight to forty nine, which which categorically states that. Jews cannot ceremonially, uh, ceremonially dine with any non-circumcised males, such as Paul's men were already well known to be. So now we need to go back because you keep highlighting the fact that, oh, but this wasn't an issue. And if we go back to Acts 11 and 3, we see Peter had earlier, years earlier, in fact, been caught in the same violation. But back then... James hadn't yet made up his mind on the enforcement of circumcision Hello? towards the non-Gentiles. To non but obviously at this point where we're talking about now, in Galatians 2 and 11, or Galatians yeah, 2 and 12, he this had point. finally made so. He had finally made his decision. Yeah, I have to unmute, but further, I'm really you, Now, further evidence that circumcision is the main issue is seen through Galatians 2, 2 to, uh, 2, 2 to 9. Because the un uncircumcised here is, un is synonymous with the Gentiles and the circumcised is synonymous with the Jews and not with those who die in kosher. Even oh. further evidence in that is in Galatians 2, verses 3 to 5 and Galatians 2 and 12, which is in the incident itself. And Galatians 5, 2 to 12 concerns the very reason for Paul's having written this letter circumcision was the only point my brother it was the only point and issue and also further than that you have acts 15 verse 2 and 3 and 5 and 19 which yo yo one two one two Jerusalem. 
And yet again, circumcision was the only point of issue. <laughs> Who's that? Right. Johnny, we hear you. Yeah, we hear you. All right. So let me just change this up real quickly because it's going um, on a bit too long. These, these two bubbles are technical right, Can I give guys. my statement? Sorry? Can I give my statement right now? Can I also to ex Muslim? Yeah, go ahead. All right, ex Muslim, you believe in the Old Testament, right? Yep, he does. Hello? Go ahead. Go, go, go ahead with the question. All right, all right. Um, in the Old Testament, it says, in the book of Ezra, it says that King Cyrus was appointed to build a temple in Jerusalem when it was destroyed by the Babylonians, and Cyrus was a follower of Zoroaster. In the book of Ezra, it says that King Cyrus had to rewrite the book of the law. When the Jews left Babylon for Jerusalem, a decree was issued by King Artgas that they must follow the law as written by Ezra. So the book was also destroyed, and it was rewritten by the Zoroasters. So we have the followers of Zoroaster constructing the Temple of Jerusalem and ordering the Book of the Law to be re rewritten and followed when the Jews went from Babylon to Jerusalem. So how, how do you actually trust the Torah right now, the Old Testament? Sorry, but you came with your loaded question and a little bit unfair on me. <laughs> all right, all right. Let me let me get this short. So um, when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed every Torah, every if, Old stop, Testament. Stop, stop. If you're not if you're not talking right now, can you can I get you guys to mute your mics, please? If you're not talking, please mute your mics. All right, go ahead. Hello, is, uh, hello, Johnny. Ex Muslim, you next. Just, just hold on. Just mute your mics. Ex Muslim, mute your mics. Ex Muslim, all right. Mic. Go ahead. Go you live in the Old Testament, right? Yes, I do, but I'm not an expert in the Old Testament. And if you're coming with a loaded question on a specific thing about the Old Testament, I'm afraid there'll be no help to you. All right. So let's let's do this. Let me go into Johnny right now. Go ahead, Johnny. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask um, Z Ziri I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. Where, where in the Quran, like, does it um, speak about circumcision? Do, 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 do. Another one. Another one. Go ahead, is Ziri. It, is the question to, oh, to Ziri, I've gone. It doesn't. As, if Ziri, I was busy. Uh, generally, I just had, uh, from my understanding, um, a lot of it comes down from Hadith, no? Quite possibly. I, oh, on, Johnny, so the Quran, the Quran don't say nothing about circumcision. Nope, it doesn't. No, I don't think nothing. I, I don't think nothing openly. Kalam, anything? Nope, nope. And nope. how about homosexuality? Nope, nope. Yeah, I nope. think in the Quran, the the nation of um, is it a nation of the lot. The lot. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that's more like a that's more like a story more than a command, isn't it? Yeah, they, but they kind of condemned for it for the action, and they kind of like. God says that he's kind of he destroys that nation for that act. So generally, scholars take that as an act that's obviously something forbidden. Otherwise, God would have not destroyed them for it. But how how do we know that's not just for the people of Israel at that time? Uh, because in terms of um, apart from that clear violation, the verse does say. Sorry to interrupt you. The verse does say, "Do you remember the times of Lot when this and that happened?" Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. that's how it says. It don't really say like, "Don't do it." Or like 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 in the Bible in Leviticus eighteen where it says like it's an abomination or okay, Leviticus it, no. twenty. Like I, do you get I, what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I get it, I get it. Generally, Islamic scholars deal with it. There's two ways of doing it. Generally, um a command when God kind of destroys a people, it's always because they've done something obviously forbidden. Because for God to destroy a people for, for them doing something that's you know disliked, it's it's too you know, for God to destroy someone, they've obviously got to do something that's forbidden. Number what one, about number America? Two, say that again. What about America? Is not going to destroy America? Oh. In my eyes, America is way <laughs> ruthless. <laughs> let's, stay than, the, uh... let's stay off the politics, bro. That's a long one. All right. In terms of um, in terms of the actual command for it, though, if you're looking for the actual command, the actual command for it being haram is actually more in tradition. So you've got clear traditions from the Prophet that forbid it, though. And 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 where is that, please? The actual sources for it. Uh, I can yeah, find the hadith, it. Is it a hadith? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hadith literature. Yeah, it's quite an abundance in terms of 
homosexuality where you know it's it's uh, forbidden. If you bear with me, I should maybe try like you know try find it for you. All right. Okay, okay, thank you, bro. No problem, bro. So I get you guys to mute your mics, please. Um, Gabs, I see you there, King. Do you have anything yeah, to say? Um, do you know? What? Yeah, I was actually, I'm actually kind of shocked. Actually, that's the first time I didn't even really know that. So, um, the Quran doesn't mention anything about circumcision, no? Nope. Uh, the Quran basically says about Prophet Ibrahim. I think follow. There's a there's a verse that says follow the way of Ibrahim. A lot of it is in terms of tradition. Yeah. So, so when you say follow him, but follow him with the circumcision as well? Or? Yeah, yeah, no, but no, because you're, there's there's a verse of the Quran which talks about following the way of Prophet Ibrahim, and in the in the, in the explanation of that verse, the scholars say that Prophet Ibrahim started five specific prophetic traditions. Uh, one was growing the beard, one was clipping the nails, one was circumcision, one was cleaning the hair underneath the armpits, and all of these traditions generally have continued up until our day. So we kind of say he was the main guy who started it. So yeah, a lot of it in, in terms of clear text comes in the actual hadith that explains the verse. But it's in hadith, yeah. I th yeah, I think I'd, I'd uh, like to add as well that um, circumcision was something that the Hanifites did, uh, the people yes. of the primordial tradition without a yes. uh, messenger coming to them. So um, it's what, um, yeah, basically. Ah, okay. okay. Mm. Yeah. yeah and a, and a, sure. a, sorry, sorry, I'd like to mention that Abraham was from the Hanifites and this is why if you look at the uh, papyri, uh, pap um, the papyrus of the comatic um, tradition, we also find that they also did circumcision as well. So it does fit into that general narrative. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything extra else you wanted to add to that, Gabs? Um, <laughs> to be fair, no, nah, you kind of went into it because it's true. Um, it's funny, yeah, because I was looking at when the brothers, um, I think it was uh, ex Muslim man Ziriab were talking about, you know, this whole I don't know what was going on that 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 discussion just a minute ago about Paul and circumcision. Um, I was just looking it up, and obviously, yeah, what the brother Joe just said, yeah, you you can find that, you know, you have the oldest depiction i won't say probably the oldest maybe not i wouldn't say the oldest but i'll say the oldest depiction which they found uh which they know of of circumcision yeah um is in uh ancient Kemet, and it's just funny i just i just wanted to know the reasons for circumcision in the quran and um uh in the bible so what was the reason um um abraham had to do this act because you know if the egyptians were doing it were they seen as pagans like how did that are they the same actually are you asking for like the reason behind of circumcision meaning what is the actual reason people do it yeah yeah because obviously in the i think because from the from the biblical standpoint it was seen as like a, a seal like abraham it had to be done like he uh, uh yeah, god yeah, told yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, I've actually been reading about this in terms of so i know that it's definitely something that obviously islamically you're you're basically um there's a there's a strong emphasis on following the way of the prophets and prophets from especially from prophet ibrahim um born onwards have always you know been um um circumcised in terms of the actual reasoning behind it the only thing in terms of actual knuckle meaning in terms of actual te textual evidence i haven't found anything in terms of text for the reasoning behind it the only thing i've studied in terms of the reasoning is from the science angle where some people try and say it's cleaner but in terms of the actual um, Islamic uh, or um, religious textbooks. I've never really found a reasoning apart from the prophets did it. Maybe, uh, brother, any any other Muslims just, on the panel might I just know. I to make it clear that you know, in 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 regards to Paul, he split away from the Jesus sect of uh, Jews, which obviously James was a part of and Peter was a part of, in the sense that he didn't adhere to the laws and covenant and the main covenant, as I said, which was signed in blood with Abraham in Genesis. Um, because obviously the people who Paul was preaching to were Gentiles and as such they were uncircumcised. So you're preaching to all of these new people, evidently they're not circumcised and they're big men, you know what I'm saying? So they don't have, uh, what do you call it, antiseptic, they don't have, uh, what do you call it, um, you know when they put you under when, when you're at the doctors? Yeah. They don't have none of that back then. And anesthetic, yeah, they don't have none of that. So the issue with Paul is the fact that his people wouldn't really like to accept that, you know. And so he had to find a way of, you know, creating this new, uh, new teaching which split away from the Jesus sect of Jews. Uh, and that's Syria to the covenant. Okay. 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 I was going to ask you. 
I was going to ask you as well, actually, like Muslim, uh, what's your take on the whole um, circumcision from Abraham? Like, do you know what, what was the reason for um, the circumcision from the from a Christian uh, point of view? Well, it was Abraham's covenant, wasn't it? But anyways, about Ziriab, you're forgetting to mention Acts 15, where both Peter and James both say circumcision is no longer necessary. So Peter, James and Paul were on the same boat. So why are you trying to cause a drift between them? <laughs> All right. It oh, makes no bloody sense what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's continue, baby. Let's continue. Let's continue. Right. Callum, I got the question. I got the answer for the brother. If you want, um, the the one I was uh, the brother that was asking about um uh, homosexuality. Yeah, go ahead. Was that brother Mirza? No, no, it's a uh, brother Johnny. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. All right, cool. So Johnny, um, in terms of the first thing, because generally in Islamic in Islamic law, for anything to be, uh, you know, have any authenticity, there's only two sources basically. It's either the Quran or it's a saying of the Prophet or his family, according to Shia tradition. Anyway, so in terms of the actual Quran, there's actually a verse. Apart in terms of the remember. It, and you know the words that you said, and remember the people of, and remember Lot, when we said yeah. to his people, do you commit the worst sin, such as none preceded you had committed in the Alameen, meaning the verse actually says that, are you, are you, do you commit sin? So it does say the word sin in it. Okay. That's, that's in terms of the Quran. So Allah does make it quite clear in the Quran that it's, you know, it's an abomination, it's a sin. And obviously that's why he destroyed the nation. So he actually so says that, number one. Does the Quran, does the Quran tell you what the sin was though? Uh, you practice that. You practice your lusts on men instead of women. Boom, bam. Mm. Yes. Seems America to me. You practice your lusts on men. Yeah, as in, I don't think it, that makes it. That gives it a nice, clear indication. Unless I don't think it's deeper than yeah. You, you verily, you practice your lusts on men instead of women. Nay, but you are people transgressing beyond bounds. That's Surah Al Araf and uh, Surah Seven, verse eighty and eighty one. So that's in terms of the actual thing. And it, obviously it's mentioned in a couple of verses, other verses as well. And that's in terms of the Quran. If we go to the Hadith literature now, um, I'll give you a narration which says that, um, again, Prophet says, um, there, is, there is nothing that I fear for my Ummah more than the deed of the people of Lot. That's one. And then the other Hadith is where the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, curse is the one who has intercourse with an animal and curse is the one who does the action of the people of Lot. Can I um can I have the name of these two hadiths, please? Of course. What I'll do for you, brother, yeah? I'll copy and paste it and put it in the description box. How's that? All right, all right. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. No problem, bro. No problem. I'd like to add to the circumcision um, discourse, which is that I mentioned that was the way of the Hanafites. And what is meant by the way of the Hanafites is actually the true primordial embryonic state of being there in the fifth law is known as is which you keep on hearing in the park i that state of pureness of so whenever the, uh, what is seen as part of the fifth right be the muslim generally are commanded to follow that way such as um at least removing the pubic hair circumcision or uh, most other things um i've got ibn Arabi's book in here when he talks about the fifth law and he goes that um, Joe, you're a bit muffled now. Just, just, just tell them in plain English. Yeah, um, you're talking about the comedic way. Just, just say it in yeah. plain English. Yeah, the comedic way. That's <laughs> 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 my point. <laughs> you know, the fitra right there, the Hanifi right there. We already know who it is. What it is? Now, Kalam, Kalam, you gotta talk to people according to their intellects. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt, no <laughs> doubt. Ex <laughs> uh, uh all roads lead to Kevin, baby. <laughs> there's gaps, there's gaps, bro. There's gaps. Um, oh, yeah, he did make mention about something earlier on today. Um, about the logos, right? Gabs, you got anything on the logos? Oh, um, who's that? The logo said, I don't know. I think he was making, I know I pulled up something on it beforehand, but did you did know what you what he was talking about? What to do with the logo? Yeah, with the word of God. You know, to be fair, I was waiting. This is why I was waiting. I, I, I see that um, ex Muslim that the, the combo started shifting. So that's why I didn't really want to jump involved. You know, the brothers was getting involved. You know, the Muslim and the Christian brothers was getting in into their meat. So I didn't want to get involved and switch it up. That's why I was waiting to see what um, ex Muslim was gonna um bring on the whole, you know, Christianity and chemetic uh, side stuff because you know. 
we're talking about the logos, you really know who that is in in uh, down in Kemi. So I was only going to add a few bits to that uh, and deal with what uh, the Bible is saying because I still wanted to find out if he had learned, you know, what was if he still um, found out what uh, Moses had been taught while he was in Egypt. You know, does he have any information on that? So we can still get into that later. You know, I don't mind. Let, let the brothers do their little. No, you know, we, they, ain't got they, much, they, we, we ain't got much more time, G. Not live online. Tell him you're still gonna watch Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, I'm still gonna have to watch it before I go to oh. sleep. Uh, no, X Yo, X Muslim, are you still there? He's there, man. He's there. He's got he's probably on Google or something. Check it out. Google scholars. But, 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 brother Johnny, just to let you know, I've uh, I've put it in the description box, both of these with the references, yeah. I think brother Mirza wanted to could jump in and say something. Yo, Go but ahead. let me let me leave ex Muslim with this. Um, when Babylon attacked Jerusalem, they destroyed every book what they had. So then the so, so then Cyrus came, he ordered them to rewrite the book. So it's like you know Islam with Uthman, like yeah. Uthman uh, uh, like burnt every uh, Quran. Same yeah. happened with Jerusalem. When the Babylonians attacked uh, Jerusalem, they destroyed every book, and then later the Cyrus he attacked it back and took all those books and then rewrote it. But, so, what's your perspective? Because I asked this question earlier. What's your perspective on uh, John the Baptist? But moreover, then the next question is, what's your perspective on Jesus? As a Yazid? On Jesus? Uh, I know. Uh, I'd like to plug in something for um, Kalam in, when he was doing the show regarding the Shahadatain, and this ties into the circumcision um, show um, talk that we were having. Um, like I said, I've got Ibn al book with me, and he goes that the first Shahada, in contrast to the second, i.e., the um, testimony which Muslims give, expresses the underlying nature of reality and is innate to human nature, and that basically he's trying to say that. A humans already possess it and this concept of the first shahada there is no god but god this oneness type unity which is the concept being portrayed can be grasped by natural reason as as in contrast to the second shahada which talks about the prof prophethood and he talks that the second rather um in contradiction to in contradistinction to the first cannot be grasped by rational reason per se as it pertains to mythos and the imaginal realm rather than the rational discourse mm. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to understand what the brother just said there did he is that with regards to um are, was you basically saying um uh people can come to a natural conclusion um um about um circumcision was that um, was that what that, not particularly circumcision per se, but the uh, I was more the general underlying theme of the first mm -hmm. shahada, which um, portrays the oneness, and then obviously circumcision comes thereafter by extension. Uh, that's much more particular. Meaning, 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 whenever you think of a, 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 a belief system, there's always two two ways you can look at it from the textual point of view and from the intellect point of view. So God is a subject that can be grasped from not only, of course, textual evidence, but rather as an intellect, you can actually grasp the concept of one God purely by your own intellect as well. I think that's what the brother's alluding to. Um, I'd like to clarify as well. You mentioned textual evidences, Raza, but yeah. we also have to remember that some people did not even actually get, uh, receive profits in that sense per se. So I there are no textual evidences in that sense. They so they, they refer on the intellect purely, purely they on the intellect. Look, they, look, they looked at the cosmos, the natural of you uh, could yes. say, and then sense. came to that conclusion of that way they did and those are the people who are referred to as the Hanfites or the people of the free fitna and then interestingly even arabi actually says uh, that those people follow the path of the of the reality with a capital r wow wow okay so so these were these were so these were so basically what you're saying is uh, a specific people in a specific area mm. were the ones that could get this um get this natural understanding of circumcision by looking at the cosmos? It, it doesn't really have to be certain people from certain, obviously there could be uh, um, many demographics that um, fit this criteria, but that this notion does exist that 
people did some groups did not actually receive profit in that sense and therefore did not have a uh, text like the quran for example and for example uh, just read it it's one sentence he goes that when muslims are to the second shahada which is muhammad is a messenger of god they commit themselves to follow the path of muhammad they commit yeah. themselves yeah. to follow the path of muhammad rather than the general path of the blessing giver not to mention the myriad of other paths that fill the cosmos so i was just bringing something back to what kalam was mentioning in these previous show regarding the shahada train uh, and this is just something that can um no people would actually um, object to me and say that ibn arabi is some mystic so to speak you don't accept him this is what the people at hyde park would tell you because they're not into the spirituality but i can actually provide the evidences from much more yes I, can I ask you a question? The reason why I said that, yeah, people in a specific area, yeah, because you know, like you said, like you mentioned, um, not every, not every, not every nation in the planet um, received a messenger. Yeah, you said there were some probably that didn't receive no prophets or messengers. Yeah, only yeah, and definitely. Then, and then, yeah, and then and the ones that didn't um, could get somehow this natural understanding of you know this um, circumcision. But I wanted to know is um, well, we know that. Uh, people that, well, worldwide, especially um, ones that didn't uh, receive a prophet, not every nation was um, dealing with circumcision. And those nations who didn't receive a, a, a messenger um, uh, very well as well would have been dealing with, you know, their natural environment, but they didn't come to the conclusion um, of practicing circumcision. So, so I'm trying to understand, uh, those people that didn't receive a messenger who dealt with the natural, you know, natural way, the natural causes and didn't practice circumcision. Um, how come they didn't grasp this message? Um, through this, like, uh, I mentioned this before that when I'm talking about this, um, looking at the cosmos and using natural reason without the help or external aid of a messenger, I'm talking about in a general sense, because circumcision is something much more particular. So, for example, there could be tribes within the Amazon rainforest, for example, who are isolated, never actually received messages per se. They would be, as you did mention, that they would be using their uh, faculties, their reason, their uh, five senses, so to speak, to come to whatever mythical or ideology or system that they have. They may not actually do circumcision. Yes, you're right. But that's not, I'm not talking about the particularity, because I'm just talking about the general notion that this. Kalab was mentioning regarding the first shahada, uh, where um, Ibn Arabi mentioned that the second shahada is actually something more particular rather than the general that everybody could accept the first testimony of faith. Um, I like that. Where, where, where is that quoted from again, my brother? Um, I'm quoting it from Ibn Arabi's um, book called The Meccan Revelations, um, which, but I, this, like I said, um, people would object to him being a mystic, but I can provide you evidences from uh, theologians who are much more into their textual evidences as well, such as Al-Ghazali, such as As-Sanusi, Al-Razi, who are philosophers from the Ash'ari paradigm rather than the Salafi Wahhabi paradigm, which they will not accept any of this anyway. Good man. Yeah, drop me some of those um, links or um, books, whatever the case is. And um, yeah, I'm interested in that still. I'm really, really interested in that. So please drop them if you can. Oh man, all right, let's see. Family, yeah, it is late. We've gone over to the thir third hour mark, yeah, and I need to cut this show up in several pieces because it's going on way too long. Um, let me just quickly check who was it next to speak? Is it you, Gabs, that's got your mic open, or somebody else? No, uh, let's up right here. Wait, wait, one second, one second, Merza. All right, so Gabs, you're cool, yeah. Um, I want to make sure because there was a question that ex-Muslim asked towards the comedic side. And I hate for this show to go off yeah, yeah. without his question being asked. And somebody yeah. said, no, 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 no. See, you know, was, um, you know, ducking his question or something stupid like that. So I definitely make sure, yeah, every loose end is actually wrapped up. Yeah, so, where is it? Because I don't know. I don't know if ex-Muslim is, if he's there or if he's left. I don't know. I think he might be busy at the moment. Ex-Muslim, you there? I'm just having a bit of show time, mate. All right. Cool. So there's, no, there's no, there's no question that you had for the comedic um, side, right? Well, I thought I did have a uh, question because I thought I got the influence from yesterday that you made the claim that the Hermetica influence for Christianity. 
but you've but you've said that's not the claim that you made yesterday so i re so i can't really ask the question okay can i ask him a question then because i saw afterwards in the comment you was you were saying some stuff you were saying that um you you mentioned you mentioned something in the comment section saying that uh you can easily debunk the uh, Kemet ideology and that you know uh christianity definitely influenced Kemet. so i would i would like to ask you the question then is uh what evidence do you have yeah in your text that shows that um christianity influenced uh, uh the Kemet way of thinking or Kemet philosophy Gabs, that was in reference to the fact that i thought you made the claim that the hermitica influenced christianity but apparently i was wrong and you didn't make that claim so that was that comment was in context of that okay so basically so, but, but the hermetica is one like what can i say it's like one it's like one source it's not like the whole of hermetic ideology or philosophy so if you if we put that if we put that book aside here yeah, what do you have did did so that my next question is um could you show me or do you think or do you believe that christianity influenced uh chemic philosophy or ideology like i said the question i was going to ask you was in context about the hermitica and i was going to make the claim if anything copied anything it was hermitica copying from christianity not the other way around but you then told me no you did not make that claim and i was apparently wrong so therefore i can't ask that question okay so i, I can see what's happening there but do you know about comedic uh, um philosophy or ideology you must know about it because obviously the hermetic art was the first time you said you heard about it um the other night obviously you knew about chemic because you you had been mentioning a few things so i want to know on the basis of what you know about chemetic philosophy and ideology yeah leave the hermetica for a side do you have um any, any evidence or do you believe that christianity may have influenced anything from kemet at this moment in time no but it seems like the christianity did influence the text in the hermetica okay cool okay let, let, let him bring that up at least go on, let him bring that up okay bring that up what in the what in the text of the hermetica did um the christians influence Callum, I'm pretty sure you went over the text itself, right? When in the first part of the show, and you talked about how this had a very strong resemblance. Maybe I've forgotten, or maybe I'm misrepresenting yep. you. Correct. It, does, strong it, does, it does have a strong resemblance with Christian, with like what some parts of the New Testament teach. Yes, yes. No? it so has a um, strong resemblance with what the Old Testament teaches. Yes. No, not the, old, what the, the New Testament the, teaches. Yes, go yeah, ahead. The, the New Testament specifically. Okay, New Testament specifically. Okay. Go ahead. So, do you therefore believe that that it was the Christians that influenced the people who wrote the Hermetica? Is is that within the realm of possibility, or do you completely dismiss that? I would say that there is no evidence to suggest that that I'm familiar with. But the evidence is was the Gospel of John was written definitely by the end of the first century AD. And we also have Philo of Alexandria who lived in the early first century AD. And both these sp speak of a um, philosophy that is very closely correlated. And we know the Hermetica was written somewhere in the second century AD. And we know that there was a group of Christians and Jews that were living during that time period. So is it not a reasonable assumption to make that Christian philosophy in inspired or influenced the her Hermetica text, especially, especially the fact that this um, a philosophy in the Hermetica text is not found in any other writings prior to the advent of Christianity. Okay, what exactly is not written prior to the advent of Christianity? Well, you, you went through to yourself yesterday about the Word and the Father and the Son of God and begotten this and stuff like that and light from light and you said that's jesus or whatever um or it influenced um the new testament understanding of jesus saying i am the light of this world and things like that so basically what you're saying is that the first time you get mention of uh, the logos and so forth is in um 
John, is that what you're saying? No, the first time I think where the Logos appears was in the writings of Philo Alexandria. And he talks about the Logos. And he was a Jew and he got his information from um, the Jewish writings and the Jewish oral tradition. And where else? And, and the Gospel of John. No, no, the Gospel of John wasn't written during his time period. No, no, I know what, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying those are the only two texts that talk about this philosophy. Okay, have you read any of Philo's work? Uh, no, but I, not directly, but I know that he does right. mention. All right, let me do this. Let's, just just real quickly, real quickly, everybody, real quickly. This is Philo's work right here. This is complete work right here. Let me just show you something. Have you actually read the book, or do you just buy books like that and keep it in your house? This is what you call scholarship, where you can find near enough on every single page, yeah, there is, oh, you can't see it on the camera. <sighs> near enough on every single page, you will find underlinings and writings going on, okay? This is what you call actual scholarship. This is what you call actual scholarship, not just buying books and just having it there to look pretty. Actual scholarship and seeing where the, the, the authors actually get their information from. Philo of, of Alexandria is writing living, residing in Alexandria, which is where? In Egypt. Most of his philosophy is coming from, according to most people, is coming from Aristotle and the Greeks, and also from the Egyptian influences as well. So, you know, if we was to be petty and say, you know what? No. You know what? He got it from the Greeks, and he got it from the Egyptians. I'm not even going to make that claim. I'm not even going to make that claim. That's too petty of a claim to actually make. You know, we have uh, the Greeks definitely. Greek are definitely talking about the logos and so forth. That's there prior to that. You know, funnily enough, actually, funny enough, let me read something for you, actually. This is called um, Black Athena by Martin Bernal. Okay, real quickly. Let's quickly do this here. So this here, the Memphite theology, which dates back to the third millennium BCE, this is, yeah. The theology describes a cosmogony according to which Patar, the local god of Memphis, and his emanation atom were the primal beings. Patar created the world in his heart, the seat of his mind, and actualized it through his tongue, the act of speech. This, though, Father Festigure um, and Father Boylan hasten to deny it, looks remarkably like the Platonic and Christian logos, the word, which already was. The word dwelt with God and was, sorry, and what God was, the word was. The God, sorry, the word when the word then was with God at the beginning, and through him all things came to be. After translating and publishing the Memphite theology, the Egyptologist James Breasted wrote, the above conception of the world forms quite a sufficient basis for suggesting that the later, latter notion of nous and logos, hitherto supposed to have been introduced into Egypt from abroad, abroad at a much later date, were present at this early period. Thus, the Greek tradition of the origin of their philosophy in Egypt undoubtedly contains more of the truth than has in recent years been conceded. Okay, so we're seeing that, you know, the Greeks had the form of the logos, the Christians had the form of the logos and the noose and so forth. Um, but it shows that we as Kemetics had this theology or this type of philosophy going back to the third millennium BCE. That's 3,000 years before the birth of Christ, okay? 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. Thank you, mate. That's that. It's that. Sorry, and if you want to go, you want to go a little bit further, that was, sorry, very quickly. That's Black Athena um, by Martin Bernal, page 140. Real quickly. Uh, real quickly. Do you have this any is, specific stop, 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 yeah. stop, stop. This is, this is what you call real, real scholarship right here. Real quickly. Okay. This is Thoth. Okay. Uh, the Hermes of Egypt by Patrick Boylan, MA. A study of some aspects of the theological thoughts in ancient Egypt. Can I get you to mute your mics, family? Real quickly. It says here, um, Thoth who stands forth among the great ancient gods as the wise and learned one, should appear as wise, a wise... Can I get you to mute your mics? Mute your mics, family. Okay. Um, Thoth, who stands forth among the great ancient gods as, as the wise and learned one, should appear as a wise creator or as a sort of demiurgic reason or logos. This may be due to the familiar tendency just mentioned to attribute to the god of a local shrine the activities of a primitive divinity okay and it continues to carry on to say it might of course on the other hand be the product of a genuinely speculative turn of ancient 
thought taking thought or reason as a creative active mode of appearance of the primitive deity a turn of thought of thought similar to that which exogigated the demiurgic noose of greek speculation okay so right here is telling you about the whole news the logos like we had this time ago, time, time, time ago. All you have to do is literally just open up any real good book on ancient Egypt. Or you could just quickly just Google Wikipedia, maybe even Thoth yourself. And you will see the text that's relating to Thoth. He is the creator of the divine words. He is thought. He's thought. He is reason. He literally embodies what it is to be the Logos. Some people would even claim itself that the word logos is actually coming from the ancient Egyptian word rech. Why the ancient Egyptian word rech? Is because you have the two uh, consonant, okay? R and K or R-K-H. That sound, when it's actually um, being spoken out, okay? The R trans or the R is actually an L sound, okay? The R is actually an L sound. So sometimes... You know, when people pronounce my name, especially if we go to Egypt right now, they'll say, yo, Karim, Karim, instead of Kalim. They'll make that mistake, okay? If you go into Nigeria right now, you know, you'll find a lot of the family out there pronouncing the R and Ls interchangeably because the R and L is interchangeable in most languages. So really and truly, the L or the R for the Rech, which means knowledge, wisdom, and so forth, is actually the L sound. The KH literally goes into the, the G sound or the Q sound, like Lach like that. So when we're talking about the logos, it's actually talking literally, literally is talking about the um the Greco ro the Greco the Greco way of saying knowledge, wisdom and understanding in Kemet, which is Rech. So like we can go down that route with you, but that's a long route of just to show you linguistics. Then we're going to show you the historical um, evidence and so forth. I really don't want to go down that route because it's a waste of time. I could just simply show you in books here yeah, where you can just find it through secondary sources instead of going through primary text. Medicine. You dig? Medicine. Pure medicine. Uh, Callum, yeah. Callum is thought the scribe of the gods credited with the invention of writing and alphabets. Oh my God! There we go. Uh huh. So yeah. that so that again, that's where the words comes in. But it's unlike anything what the New Testament uh, talks about the word of okay. my brother being the word. Take my time, brother, my brother. This what this what I would love for you to do is take time. Yeah. Again, it's take a time. vague resemblance. No, no, no. This what, you, this is what you need to do. You need to take time. Okay, this is what you should do. Take time. Anytime I say something to you, okay, don't simply do a quick Google, Wikipedia search and so forth. Take time. Digest the information, yeah, and see it itself, okay? Understand what the divine principle of logo or the divine principle of Jehuti is, okay? Understand it first before you make, like, these brash, um, you know, like, decisions in your, in your moves, Okay? Don't simply try to refute or object, object to it. Simply try to understand it first. The thing is, Kalam, yesterday you were talking about Patar and Ra and Amun and how apparently this is um, like the, the Trinitarian understanding of God. Yet I did my own research afterwards and really? these are three distinct beings of God. So again, this is another form of tritheism and it's absolutely unlike anything to do with the orthodox understanding yeah. of the Trinity. They are, th they are three dif distinct persons. Three distinct persons. Exactly what um, the Christian narrative of the Trinity is. Is, is the substance of Amun the same as the substance of uh, Ra? Yes. Provide... Yes. Yes, oh, yes. Come on. Come on. we read this, so. we so read this out done. yesterday to you, okay? We read this out yesterday to you, okay? They're just three different personages, okay, of the one divine being, Netcher or Necheru. Usually when we talk about God, we talk about God in the plural, i.e. Necheru, okay? And we usually put three, three lines underneath it. But the three uh, is it, actually is, a is unity. It, is this a chromatic understanding, Kalam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chromatic understanding now. So, Kalam, is that is that is that is that similar to the Trinity then, or no? Um, yes. So we got we got various different forms. Okay, we have various different things. We've got trinities. We've got triads. Um, you know, we have uh, you know, we have different forms of threes. Okay, but this form of tr three that we're talking about is very similar towards the Trinity. The better form of the Trinity. Um, in terms that really lines up in terms of the Christian understanding of what the Trinity is, 
would actually be the three deities or the three natures, which is Ra, Jehuti, and Ma'at. Okay, uh, yeah. these are the three primordial, um, um, you know, uh, divinities. Yeah, three primordial divinities where all creation of how all creation came into existence. Okay, mm. before so this the heavens and the earth was created by these three divine um, beings working together. Callum, this is what the Leiden hymn says: "All gods are three: Amun, Ra, and Ptah, whom none equal. He who hides his name as Raman." He appears to the face as Ra, and his body is Patar. How is that like anything like the Christian mm -hmm. Orthodox understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity? Okay, mm -hmm. explain the Trinity. This is all I'd like you to, to do, yeah? Explain the Trinity, and then we'll explain um, the tri the, that Trinity to you. Okay, so the Trinity can be summarized in three premises. Premise one, do one at a time, just one at a time, and then we'll okay. just break it down. One, I even break this down for you inside of the comment section okay. yesterday. Premise one, there is, there is only one God. Premise two, there are three persons, and premise three, each person is fully God. Okay, so number one, okay, comedic theology: God is one. God is one. That's number one, okay, of your principle. Number two, what is the number two premise? There are three persons within that one God. Okay, all yeah. gods are but three. It says it said there to you earlier on. All gods are three, right? It, yeah, all gods are three: Amun Ra and Ptah. Again, that sounds like tritheism. Again, we we okay. If we make if we tell you now, number one, yeah, that God is one, and then we're saying all gods are three. What does that mean to you? Say that again. If I've just told you God is one. And all gods are three. I have absolutely no clue what that means. Okay. So that means that there is one God. Okay. But you can multi... Okay. In terms of personages, they appear in three as three, which is Amun, Ra, and Ptah. But do they make one third of God? No, they don't make one third of God. Can I ask, is is Armin Patar? Armin is not Patar. Armin is not Patar. Does he have a separate will from Patar? Armin does not have a separate will from Patar. I'd just like to get in there and say I think this is an example of youthful vigor. Um, I said to ex ex Muslim or Russell to at least take some time out. You had only heard of the Hermetic and how, uh, yesterday, so uh, um, do some research first. It sounds like a complex, co complex one, man. I just don't know. So you're saying the Kemetic religion is monotheistic? So we don't say monotheistic in, in a sense like that, but we do say God is one. What does that mean? God, one what? One banana? One what? It's just one. One it's what? Unified, it's one. God is one. What is that? One what? Okay. So in God being one, in God being one, there is nothing outside of God. There is only God, oneness. Okay. Yeah. God literally split himself. Okay. Or the essence, um, you know, let's say like this, split himself into three different personages. Okay. Okay. So that's called partialism. No. Yes, no. did. you just said he split himself into three. That's partially. Okay. Now listen to what I'm saying to you. The essence, okay? The essence is one. Okay? Essence. But it now the essence, yeah. the essence is one. Okay? But it now splits itself into three personages. Okay? The three personages, I'm going to utilize Greek right now, is furthermore, let me just do it like this so you can actually see it. I'm going to go from a Greek understanding first, because it's the better way to actually explain it. To a western mind real quick um can i just uh, kind of clarify it would it be using this analogy would it be like having a jug of water and then pouring out three glasses of that water would that be an accurate analogy yeah that would actually be okay so that's that's not the doctrine of the trinity okay so no, anyways no, because the one jug All the right, doctrine so 
Anyways, real quickly, okay? So right here, we see here, we have something called uh, the noose right here, which is mind, okay? Then we have something here, which is called the logos. Then we've got something called here, the pneuma. And over here, it tells us all three of them, oh, sorry, the mind and the logos is united by life, which is another way of saying spirit. All three of them are united. We showed you yesterday. Let me see if we if we can get up the stuff that we showed you yesterday about the three gods. Um, all gods are three or something like that in Amun and so forth. Yeah. Um, all gods. You know, I can't. Even, I don't even have the time, man. I'm I'm really tired to even be doing all of this. This is just elementary stuff. Like to be honest with you, it's really you elementary. Man go, stuff. You man go light with Ruslan, you know. You man so, go real light. I know because you know what? We we, we don't want to alienate people, so I would have to go light. <laughs> but he's so so young. <laughs> <laughs> you know but my brother like take some time out and just do the research g you know do the research the thing please. is you again quoted from the hermitica and the hermitica as i said came after the advent of christianity why can't you provide any sources direct sources of like tablets or scrolls or anything like that where it talks about this um this where it talks about the same philosophy as it's talking about in the hermitica that's all I'm, i want all right all right he's sticking it on you bro yeah, <laughs> because you keep going to the hermitica and i'm right. telling you it comes all right. To Christianity. all right there you go all right here, here we go real quickly yeah this is let me do this yeah i'll give it to you like this this is in the coffin text okay if you've got the ability to go and check um what the coffin text is um please go and check that Okay. In coffin text. Coffin text. Yeah. If you have the ability to go and check, go and check what the coffin text is. The coffin text yeah, is literally explaining exactly about the Hermetica, where you have the waters, you have the darkness, you have the chaos, all of those things that's incorporated in your Genesis 1 story. Okay. It's literally right here. Yeah. Inside of the coffin text. Okay. But real quickly, um, you know. Let me just see. I'm just pulling something out real quickly. All right. Okay. Then said Atum to the waters, I am floating very weary in um, the natives inert. It is my son, life, who lifts up my heart that will live in my heart. When he has drawn together these very weary limbs of mine, the water said to Atum, kiss your daughter, Porda. Put her to your nose and your heart will live. They will not be far from you. That is your daughter, Order, and your son, Shu, whose identity is life. It is of your daughter, Order, that you shall eat. It is your son, Shu, that shall elevate you. I, in fact, am life, son of Atum. It is from his nose that he bore me. It is from his nostrils that I emerge. I shall put myself at his collar, that he may kiss uh, me and my sister, Order, when he rises every day and emerges from his egg. When the God is born in the emergence of sunlight and homage is said to him by whom, sorry, by those whom he begot, I am life. And it continues. It continues to get, go on and forever and forever go on. But over here, yeah, I really know, yeah, this is going to completely lose you because it's filled with so much metaphor, yeah, that you're going to be lost. And I'm not trying to be condescending to you at all, yeah. But if I ask you now, yeah, do you understand what was stated here? I'm pretty sure, yeah, you're not going to talks do about. I don't know. It sounds like God having sex and producing daughters and sons, which is <laughs> unlike the doctrine of the Trinity. There you go. There How you long go. you're That's barking up the wrong tree? There you go. That's the reason why. That's the reason. Stop. That's the reason why I decided not to go there with you, yeah. And I tried to give you something that's very linked on where a Western mind can try to comprehend. I'm Over there, there was no. I'm not Western. Sorry? Oh, no. I'm from the Middle East, not Western. Yes, but you have a Western conceptualization. What I mean by Western conceptualization, I'm talking about a Christian understanding. You do not have an Eastern understanding of Christianity, Whoa. Of, of Christianity neither. You have a Western understanding of Christianity. Let's call it a spade a spade. But anyways, yeah, um, where we just went there, yeah, there was no talk of sex. There was I'm nothing from like Azerbaijan. That. Pause, pause, pause. There was no talk of sex or anything like that, yeah. And you already came up with some erroneous conceptualizations. So that's the reason why we choose not to go there. It says, I begot you. What does beget mean? Does it mean bringing them flowers? Okay. So that's, this, this is... You're twisted, man. This is why, yeah. This is, this is why. Sorry, How did you get to that? 
out. You know, it, it talks. You know. A, it talks about the son, and then it talks the daughter of the son, or things like that. Then it says begot. It's completely <laughs> zero resemblance to the doctrine of the Trinity. Why can't you accept it? It's like you Rastani. lost Christianity so much. Wow. And so, let, me, let, let me let me do it like this. Let me do it like Rustlan, okay? Because you've got skewed vision, okay? So now I do. Wear we said, look, we said if we said, look, Jesus is the only begotten Son of 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 the Father. Hmm. Did the Father now have sex? Like you be looking at me to be like, what type of stupidness is you're, you're saying to me? Well, I hope you be looking at me to say, what type of stupidness you're saying? First of all, the Koine Greek language is the word monogenes. The word monogenes comes from two words, monos and genes, which means the one and only and unique. The begotten is a KGV translation of that, which came in the 16th century. Bro, anyone look Greek in there to you? Pardon? <laughs> Wait, I'd like to add uh, Ruslan, Ruslan. Um, I think you're jumping the gun, and I think this is your youthful passion, to, so to speak. I would say to take some time out and for Kalam. I think this is why we need more lessons on symbology. And I just don't know why it's so hard to bring some evidence. Uh, begotten here does not literally mean have a copulate. What are you talking about, bro? Wow. <laughs> This this is why yeah this is why we say take time relax for a hot second you know take time relax for a hot second like I really know I really know that you have no um, ambition to really understand um, kinetic philosophy okay so this is this so even doing all of this yeah is like I'm thinking it's even a waste of my time to be going through all of yeah, this yeah I was just about you. to say that kind because... of what, what is what is the actual <laughs> end result are you trying to Get my man to become a chemic believer. Is he gonna leave his? No, he ain't never no, doing that, bro. So no it's a complete waste of time. It's, it's a complete waste of time, yeah. But Ruslan, okay, this is what you need to actually do. Just take some time out. Go and do some studies. If you actually are interested in this topic, yeah. Oh, don't you worry about it, that, Colin. I, I said this before. <laughs> I said this before. <laughs> I said this before to you, yeah, like, take some time out, go and research this and take away the Christian um, lens and try to understand it from an African standpoint and view. The but thing is, Kalam, it, hold on one second, a lot of it, a lot of it is filled with symbology. One line alone, yeah, yeah has multiple, um, you know, depths to it. And I know for a fact that you're not catching the multiple depths to it. Me, myself, yeah, I'll be real with you, yeah, I, I've said this before. When I've spoken about the Book of the Dead, I literally put that book down for about 10 years. Yeah. Every single time I picked that book up to try to read it, I could not comprehend and understand it. Unfortunately, I still have my Western lens on it. Okay. Right, I, right, right, right. And I really know there is no way you're going to be catching it, the levels of the, depth that's been spoken. The thing is, Kalam, I really like you as a brother in humanity. However, what slightly pisses me off is you claiming that the Trinity was present in Kemetic philosophy. And I asked the evidence, and then you can't give it to me. And then you say, oh, you, you pissed can't him off understand this. Boy. You can't understand that. And I'm reading here, it says ancient Egyptian, egyptonline.co.uk. Ra was often described as the father of the gods. He was sometimes thought married to Hesat, although the latter is usually referred to as his daughter. Yeah, sounds very like the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so again, yeah, unfortunately for you, yeah, you're looking at things, you're looking at things from a Western point of view. You're seeing the word there, married. But then we, if I say to you, hmm, so does Christ have a bride? Does Christ have a bride? And you're going to say, yes, he does have a bride. But does it have a literal bride? You'd be like, no, he doesn't have a literal bride. It's talking about the church and so forth and so forth. So if you can understand symbology yeah, from a very basic level for your Christianity, why do you simply jump to conclusions when you go and look at somebody else's culture? Okay, because, Kalam, you seem like you know your stuff. Can you explain it to me? Wow. Okay. So if you really would like to be explained to you, yeah, we have just... Literally, the main mention of the three parts of the Trinity. Yeah, this is literally before creation. Okay, there is no being, there is no beings around right now. All there is is the waters, the primordial waters, um, Ra's son or, or Atum's son and his daughter. Okay, Atum's son and daughter. Okay, you have the presence of Shu. Okay, which in other, um, you know, Shu right here is also um, represented as Jehuti. Okay, and most people who actually understand Kemetic philosophy, let me just quickly do this real quickly. Can I get you to mute your mics? 
real quickly. Mute your mic. Every single time your mic is open and it has a mad feedback on. So right here, let's just quickly show the family who actually would want to learn. So you have a principle right here, okay, is shoe. All right, this principle here represents air and light and so forth, okay? And as you see here on top of his head, he has got a feather, okay? Now this feather, okay, you will usually find it with this being, okay, over here, Jehuti, Soth, and so forth. He is the one, okay, who's, as you can see here, he's represented as an abyss bird headed individual, as a scribe, okay? He literally represents wisdom, um, understanding, math science anything that the brain has the ability to produce okay and usually you might just see him writing something which is called mat this is the feather right here that you usually see him writing now that feather is actually something over here called mat mat this is her right here with the wings okay you can see a lot of the symbology i'm not even going to do i should really do this here which is a symbology of the holy spirit coming down in the form of a dove whenever you hear about the holy spirit okay prior to the new testament is usually spoken of as a feminine you hear the principle Whoa. of the she of the shekinah which is written about in the principle of the feminine all the time Okay, wisdom is always written about in the principle of the feminine. This is this being here. Okay, that doesn't really Which look is... like a dove, does it? No, slow down. 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 Yeah. All right. So you usually have this principle here. Which is always accompanied, yeah, with which is a primordial being, okay, primordial being, meaning ma'at always existed before creation, okay. Reasoning always existed before creation, and they all existed as part as being light and life with the Father, who is um, the Father of all, which is atom or ra, okay, which represents consciousness. Real quickly, ra, okay, which is the solar deity here. OK, and we can go into Philo, which I've got right here, which we've done in, in previous shows. And you'll see that Yahweh is always identified as a son or they, he makes the claim of a solar deity. OK, being the father of all, giving forth light and good and life and so forth. OK, so this is it right here. You won't even get to see it because you may not see it. So right here is saying it is my son life who lifts up my heart. OK. Lives of my heart that will live in my heart when he has drawn together these very weary limbs of mine. Okay. The water said, the water said to Atum, kiss your daughter order. Okay. Kiss your daughter order. Now you may not even catch this, but most of us who are from the comedic school of understanding, when you're seeing the word here, order, we're talking about Ma'at. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Ma'at was already existing with Atum. Okay. And then let's just quickly carry on. Put her to your nose and your heart will live. Okay. Put her to your nose and your heart will live. This is symbology to saying that it is fire um, order and justice and righteousness and so forth. Yeah. Your, um, you know, your ability to, um, how can I put it? Put into your heart, put into your nose, meaning like this is what you live on. This is your um, your sustenance. This is something that you abide by. This is something that's so deeply um, constituted with inside of yourself that you cannot move beyond justice. Every single act that you do is just. Every single act that you do is good and so forth. OK, and it says and your heart will live. OK, when you're talking about heart again, this is a symbology for consciousness. OK consciousness or your mind that will live that means live is mean for eternity not just simply now but for all eternity all your actions everything that you produce here will be that of just justice and goodness anyways it continues on those to say here they will not be far from you okay how can they be far from you they're part of you that is your daughter order and your son Shu, whose identity is life it is your daughter order um you shall eat and again, when we're talking about eat, we don't, somebody might be saying, oh, look, it's cannibalism. Look, how is he eating his daughter? And so forth. Again, it's not talking about no physical daughter for somebody to eat. It's talking about, um, you know, the, the, the metaphor of consuming something and being sustained by it again. It gives you two, um, uh, you know, concepts of being, of being sustained. One via your nose, you breathe in for sustenance. One through your mouth, meaning you consume it 
and your whole being is filled with it. It is your son's shoe that shall elevate you in terms of your consciousness and so forth. Okay. And I, in fact, am life, son of Atum. So this is um, Shu now speaking forth. Okay. He is also represented, Shu is also representative of, um, of it could be who, Shu, who, and also Jehuti, the ability to speak and reason. Okay, it is from his nose that he bore me, it is from his nostrils that I emerged. Now, these principles right here, yeah, is, is twofold. Twofold when he's saying it's from um, his nose that he bore me, it is from his nostrils that I emerged, it's talking about the principle yet again. He came from his being, he emanated. We did, we did in ancient Egypt, there was various um, ways to say something literally came from something. So, one way is to say it is begotten, i.e produce sexually another way is to say you know spitting something out meaning it's coming from within me to come outwards that's another um, metaphor that we use um, for emanation another metaphor we utilize for emanation is i.e you know pushing something outside of your nostril so it's letting you right here right letting you know right now that this principle called shoe emanated from the divinity okay emanated from the divinity and it's pulling a um, reference to the nostrils right now yeah because the nostrils is something synonymous for breath and life okay so it's making you know that i am life okay and it's letting you know i came from his nose and so forth i should put my um i should put myself at his column for anybody of you guys who know a little bit more to do with um Egyptian um, hieroglyphs, you got the uh, the hieroglyph, which is the Ankh. Most people, we talk about the Ankh being the circle, the line, and the, and the line going downwards. But, um, you know, further research, you'll know that the Ankh is actually, um, you know, who does a very good breakdown of this is Asai Mahotep. He lets you know that the collarbone is originally what the term Ankh comes from. So if you look at your chest, you have the sternum, and then around your collar, okay is that circular thing and then going from left to right is is the you know for those of you going you know you know what i'm talking about it's very difficult to describe a picture to you right now in terms of a hieroglyph so this principle over here is talking about that life coming forth from um or emanating from him then it carry on to tell you here that it is that he may kiss me and my sister order okay so he's letting you know that these two beings are twins okay these two beings are actually twins okay and um who's his sister order this is ma'at yet again when he rises every day and emerges from his egg when the god is born in the emergence of sunlight and homage is said to him by those whom he begot and now it's, it's actually going on into um the forms of prayer that human beings do every single day when the sun rises in the east because the east is is symbolic of knowledge and wisdom when the sun rises, you're able to see things and you're able to know things. So it's all symbology going on over here. Then it continues to talk about I am life, Lord of years, life of eternal reoccurrence, Lord of eternal sameness. Now, all of this is a, a lot of symbology in here. I'm not even going to go into it, but over on, it's going to continue to let you know when he starts to create um, the heavens and the earth. The eldest that Atum made with his efficacy. When he gave birth to Shu and Tefnut in Heliopolis, when he was, sorry, when he was one, okay, when he was one and developed into three, when he parted Geb from Nut, okay, so this is Geb and Nut, it's talking about the separation, and a lot of my um, my Muslims should, should see a similarity yet again, separating Geb from Nut, this is separating the earth, okay, or the, or the principle of the earth from the principle of the heavens or the skies, okay, before the first crop was born, before the two original Enneas developed and were existed with me, it is in his nose that he conceived me, it is from his nostrils that I emerge, he has placed me at his column and he does not let me go far from him, my identity is life, son of the original God, how I live in the Besnu of my um, father Atum, I am life at his collar, the one who freshes the throats, who Atum made as grain when he sent me down into this land, the Isle of Fire, where my identity became Osiris, son of Geber, so forth and so forth. All right. So it is a lot of symbology in there. Okay. But for those, those of you lot who can spot it, the Trinity idea is here. Okay. It's literally here. And we'll literally have to break it down to you why it's here. We're seeing that there is one essence, yeah, one essence that splits into three different distinct beings that have their own personality in the sense that they have their own characteristics that are distinct from each other, i.e. the principle of order and justice and so forth, which is, which is um, 
you know, in, in terms of characteristics, the, the the being itself of creator, the creator itself, its characteristics itself is to always do things that is just, that's true, that is in balance, that's in harmony. Then it's got the second principle, which is life. And that life principle is talking about the heart and speaking things into existence, which you'll see later on in the creation dialogue. And then you've got the first principle, which is the atom, which is the self-aware one. The atom, literally, atom literally means the complete, the whole, the one, okay? And that is emerging out of the waters and so forth. But I don't even want to go into much more details than that. That's just a simple breakdown. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Raza, are you there? I want to ask Woo! Raza a question. That was I, I'm sick. Sick. Uh, Callum, Callum, just You're blowing good, everyone away, bro. Raza, yeah, he's, yeah, he's blown everyone away, right? Raza, but you're like the neutral one here, right? And you can judge everything oh, okay. neutrally, right? Go Do on. you honestly, in your heart of hearts, believe that this has any resemblance to the historic understanding of the trinity whether you believe in it or you don't believe in it like what he, kalam just said now just be honest Raza. yes yes so mean, meaning does it have some sort of link to it not some sort of link a direct link no if if someone's going to look at it from if, if someone's going to put christianity's uh, theology theology theolo theology about the trinity and their, the way that kalam's explained it you're going blatantly going to see some similarities i agree I'd, I'd like to add that I see loads of similarities with the Orthodox Islamic belief as well, such as Ma'at being a feminine principle. Um, I do see similarities, uh, ex-Muslim, I'm not going to deny it. And a lot, I see lots and lots from the symbology of the heart to Atum. Raza, Raza, you got to yeah. be careful, Zachariah is about to come. <laughs> but, uh, but, but ex-Muslim, I think that's what Kalam Damla always try and say. They always try and say that they were the first and then i think they'll argue the opposite and say we got it from them <laughs> i think it's i think it's absolutely ridiculous that that text had any influence on christian philosophy I mean, one, one question one question to ex-muslim is this do you feel insecure that if it was influenced by this text that it would have some spotlight no no, no. i feel like you're hyperventilating over something i'm not that. hyper i'm not hyperventilating <laughs> right at anything this because he says the one being split into three beings again that's not the doctrine of the trinity and if you said that at one point in time you would get burned at the stake for it right oi, so, oi, oi. no no I'm, I'm just saying that so that's never been the historic understanding of the trinity and Callum said that so i think it's absolutely ridiculous that this sort of one god splitting himself into three parts and then they become three distinct beings all right you know exposed let me ask Callum a question yeah because I, I, obviously I know, but Kalam's been trying to close the show for a little while, but I know he's long the off as well. But Kalam, here we go, call it. Look, in terms of the theology, Kalam, in terms of the Kemet, from, bruv, like I said, I'm very limited on my Kemet understanding because it goes deep, bruv, as you've clearly just shown. However, what I will say is now, is that generally Kemet, Kalam, is about, it's always been introduced as something as monothe monotheist, as in it's a one God concept, true? Correct, correct, correct. All right, cool. Now, when it comes to the one God concept, Kalam, in terms of what you've explained and what ex muslim has been talking about how do you tie that into this three this three you know these three personalities who were those three were they part of god or were they separate entities where did those three come into it kalan because okay. i thought it was just one god okay so yeah there is just one god okay but now we're breaking down the constitute the constituent constituent parts of God right now, yes. and we get into a much more deeper level. We can always say there is one God. Okay, that's cool. That's a that's a very basic level. Of and course. then when you learn a bit more about Islam, for example, uh, you know you learn about Allah, but now you go into mm -hmm. his names. It's now you true. go into his attributes. Now we go into his actions true. and characters and so true. forth. You true. See what yeah. I'm saying. So we're now going into a very deeper level. I can just tell you. Yep, there is one God. And then everybody could be cool with that. But now we need to go into it for those who want to go into a deeper level. OK, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. how did he create? Now you have to go into the level of, OK, he spoke things into existence. OK, did he really have a voice to speak things into existence? No, he didn't have a voice to speak things into existence. It's, it's, yeah, um, it's, it's I get it. That we're realizing here. OK, so what does it mean to speak? Speech is obviously, you know, words can literally come out from somebody's mouth. But then also before you actually literally speak something out, you're actually um, thinking about something inside of your head. OK, yes, this is subtly going on. The images and the concept is all going in. 
And then we we talk about those different images and concepts and we give them stories or mythoses. So somebody, um, you know, a little child could pick up a very complex, um, um, you know, a very complex thesis, okay, from a very young age. And the more that they develop and grow, yeah, we'll explain it from a, a deeper, a deeper and a deeper. Yeah, deeper yeah I get it. All right. So kind of on top on top of that, I'm going to ask you this. Yeah, I, I get 100 percent exactly what you said on a basic. Anyone can just say there's one God. However, everyone's got their deeper theology. And I respect that. Now, in terms of the three, uh, the three things that ex-Muslim was talking about, are those three part of God? Then they're, they're not they're not they're not like humans. They're basically characteristics to describe God. Then there you go. So, again, it, it makes it very clear. Yeah that these beings emanated or came from him or born from him. Now, these are just um, terms that we utilize to say, like, okay, put it like this. Okay, so for over here, when we brought up the three, when he was one and developed into three. Now, somehow, um, my brother has a problem with this, okay? This statement here. Now, we will, he, will quickly to he will quickly tell you that the father, okay, mm. was what? Mm. The father eternally mm. begot the son okay the father yeah. eternally begot the son but then when we tell you that the son was begotten where was it it says here uh, and paid homage and said to him by those whom he begot and when we utilize the same word here it's like no there's something wrong with it okay then we tell we say to you again that it emanated so the spirit um proceeded from the father so you have mm. two things going on in Trinity, okay? The the um, the spirit proceeded from the Father, and the Son is eternally begotten. It's the same concept that is actually going on in the sense that the um, the daughter here, which is Maat order, which is the spirit of truth, literally Maat means truth, literally, okay? The spirit of truth proceeded or proceeded from the Father, and also the Son Shu, okay, was begotten from the Father over here as well. Now, this is, this is when we're talking about this, yeah, we're literally saying to you that the authoritative power, okay, which is, let's say, the will, the authoritative power of the will, yeah, literally gave birth, okay, not literally, let me say it like this, metaphorically gave birth to its ability to reason. What do I mean by that? Okay, let's just imagine that they, all there is is the father. Okay, or oh, sorry, not let me, let me know. Let me not even go down the route of father and so forth. Okay, let's just do this. Let's just say there is a single point right here, okay, which is the crown. Okay. Yeah. Now this crown can only move in in a particular direction. Let's just utilize geometry right now. For those of you lot who mm. studied Euclid and geometry, you might gauge what I'm talking about. So this right here goes here. Okay. And it now creates a second point. Okay. So you have the dot, which creates the line, which creates a second point. Now this dot and this line has the ability to now do what? Rationalize, because there's two things. When you talk about ratio or rationalizing, it's from the root ratio. Literally, you could do two or two plus one or two two going against one and so forth so you've got two things going on now you've got two ways you're not simply thinking thinking is a linear way of, of of moving just thinking one way but now when you're reasoning you're able to think more than one way you're able to think two ways so the ability to reason has now been formed but this is something that has eternally happened we're not just saying that the father the father sorry we're not just saying god um, you know, created his ability to reason and so forth. We're not really saying that. We're just saying if we was to go further and further and further back here, what was what would be the prime thing? What would be the prime thing inside of God's constituent constituent parts? We're gonna say, mm, his ability to think or will or decree things, and his ability to reason. And then also, he always he has to always be an eternally good. He also has to be eternally wise. You know, and that's a third characteristic that we put there. So we say that the spirit which is a, an extra element to him yeah has the ability to be truth has the ability to always be just has the ability to always be morally right and upstanding mm -hmm. and, so forth. and these three different principles literally Explain make up the godhead literally makes god who he is that's so what it's we're like, saying it's like, it's like what we have attributes um Callum, the way it's the way muslims have attributes that's like, right. i've got um, ibn arabi's uh, book with me bezels of wisdom and he goes that in the divine presence Yo, guys, can I can I just quickly flip this just for one second? Um, ex-Muslim, are you there, my friend? Hello, ex-Muslim, are you there? He is not. Can I ask you a quick question? Um, all right. <laughs> so, could you describe to me the Trinity within the Bible? So it's it's three three parts. What are they? It's not three parts. That's not the correct terminology to use. Okay. All right. Okay. What terminology would you what terminology would you like me to use? Three persons. Three persons. Okay. Could you could you describe them to me, please? 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Father. So is is the Father God? Is that right? The Father is God. Yeah. Okay. And the Spirit belongs to who? The Spirit belongs to no one. So is the Spirit not associated with God at all? No. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, is 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 the spirit not associated with God at all? No, the spirit is God as well. Oh, the, oh. okay, I see what you're saying. Like so I said, spirit, we believe. Sorry, sorry no, no, hold on, wait. So the spirit is God as well. Okay, and the son, the son, would that be part of God as well? Again, even the term part should be like in inverted commas. That's not okay. Invert as much as you like, but is that associated with God? Is the is the son associated associated with God? Yes. Okay, so you can understand that, but you can't understand what Callum's saying. No, because... How is that possible? Because... It's the what, same thing that he's describing to you. You can understand why. What is it? Because... because in, Cognitive in, dissidence. You're, 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 you're choosing not to understand. In that it. text, he's Could, talking about the one splitting into three. Can I ask... Um, the sh but he, you just described one splitting into three yourself in your own religion. So no, why can you believe it for finish. yours, but you can't believe it for someone else's? Let, let me finish, right? So... Kalam, you know Atom, he had uh, the son called, what was he called again? Oh, called Shu or Jehuti. Go okay, ahead. He, he was called Shu. Did Shu have, uh, did he come into existence? He was begotten of the father. Did he come into existence? He was always existing. He was always existing. Oh, okay. And in that text, it says he was always existing. This is this is here. This period of time is before creation. So there is at this point in time, this is eternality. This is eternality. Okay. So before creation, Shu existed. Oh. So that sounds very if that's the case, isn't that similar then? Because you're trying to say they're both you're trying to say Kalan, they've always existed. That's quite similar then. I think everybody can see that, but apart from um, ex Muslim. Yeah. Kalan, yeah. who's Tefnut? Oh, here we go. You just look for that. Tefnut would be in this in this instance right here, it would be the equivalent to Ma'at right here. And Ma'at would be like the equivalent to the Holy Spirit, like if we were to compare, we was to go like into, feminine. We was going to go into the Christianic version. Ma'at would be um, synonymous with um, or equivalent with the Spirit of Truth. Yes, right. Mm. Um, it's just it says here in Pyramid Text five two seven, Atom was creative in that he proceeded to masturbate himself in Heliopolis, <laughs> his penis in his hand, so that he might obtain the pleasure of organ. <laughs> and the brother and sister were born. That is Chu and Tefnut. Oh, no. Yeah, it really sounds like the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> really sounds like the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. And that Again. comes from Pyramid Text 527. If you're if you're into your cometism, you would know what it is. Thou shalt not cast the pearls to swines. Exactly. One. Exactly. Uh, I've got. I've got I'd like to mention. I plug in um, something um, here. Got Ibn exactly. Arabi's bezels of wisdom here, and he goes. Oh, could you mute your mic, please? Exactly. Hold on. You mute your mic. One second. Okay. So again, this is the problem that when you open up certain things like this, um, you know, people want to just take it elsewhere. So early on, we made mention of the three ways. Okay, we understand. Um, how can I put it? Emanation from a physical standpoint. And we said there is one way, which is sexually. That's one way, sexually. Okay. The second way we said is either through um, your mouth. So spitting, okay. Or doing anything via your mouth. That's the second way of emanating something or getting the idea of come something coming out of you or emanating from you. Then the third way as well is through your nostrils. Okay. Through your nostrils. So these are the three different ways that you can discuss it. Now, if you go into any of the comedic texts themselves, they describe it depending on which text you go to in one of those three ways. Okay. One of those three ways it describes it. And why does it describe it like that? Because you have the two principles of Shu and Tefnut, or how can I put it as air and moisture? Okay. Air and moisture. What do we mean by air and moisture? Because in order to sneeze something out, it is the act of pushing or gushing forth. And then there is also moisture. In the act of spitting, there is also the act of 
air and moisture yet again okay you have if you spit you have air and moisture coming out and again when you're talking about um you know how can i put it um ejaculating you have as the quran talks about the gushing forth the gushing yeah. forth. I was about to the concept of air and water being um, spoken about. And again, you brought up the pyramid text where it's talking about um, masturbation. That's in another way of letting you know, because of course, you cannot just simply, um, sperm doesn't simply come out of a, a human being. Um, it has to come out sexually, i.e. by having sexual intercourse. But the whole um, point that is trying to zone into you, that there is nobody around to for that act of um of, of gushing forth to come forth or emanation to come forth. So the best way we could utilize the metaphor is to utilize it by masturbation in the sense that you physically, that being was the one who physically um, gush for this this, yeah. this other principle. Some people, I know, I know, I know. When we hear these things, and it's in relationship to God, people might think like, "Ooh, is that mocking? Ooh, is that a bit funny?" And so forth. But of course, with a grown up mentality, yeah, we don't. I, I personally don't find it um, funny. I can understand how you can find it funny. I can understand how you can mock. I can understand all these things. But that's when you're coming from a particular level of understanding. In terms of an African, um, you know, philosophy, we utilize nature. To explain things okay we utilize nature to explain things and we say let's just use our human bodies to explain <laughs> concepts that are abstract to the mind how can we best explain something emanating from something so for example we can now say that um you know god emanated uh the spirit or god emanated the logos or god emanated the sun but nobody has a concept a physical tangible concept of what that means to emanate but if we now says um you know god you know, literally spat forth something. We understand that it came from within inside of his essence itself, and it now was projected externally or outwards. Does that make sense? Then we have we could do it with all the three means okay. as well. Okay, so it's a metaphor. It's it's, it's basically a metaphor. Yeah. Yes. All of it. All of this. All of this. Just 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 to um you know pre preface all of this. Yeah. No kemetics, okay, believe that the principles, listen to what I'm saying, the principles that all of the natures are physical human beings or anything like uh, that. We are all principles. You know what? I think I think my brother, my brother, my brother um, Joel reminded me. I think did um did Shamsi mention this first? I think he mentioned something like this in it back in the Kalam. Mm -hmm. Possibly, yeah, yeah. I think this is uh, the difference between um, so what hold on, I'm finished. I'm finished. So what we do, we attach allegories, we attach symbology, we attach yeah. analogies, we attach similes, and we attach metaphors yeah. and myths to construct um yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so it's it, 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 it's, it's like Callum, it's like i've got hands i've got i've got face i've got hands it's the same thing in it Callum. exactly exactly the same thing but then when you when you say does he really have hands and feet we say no oh, hell no, no really of course not a lot has hands and feet and so forth we just utilize or speak in a language that human beings can understand understand those okay, of us okay, who are okay, on a okay, higher okay. level we understand the metaphors and the symbolism behind a hand. We understand that, you know, what it means to be powerful. Your hand is a, is a symbol of power. A hand is a symbol of giving something. The hand is a, some, a symbol to show your wealth and so forth and so forth. We understand the metaphors. Oh, it's so that we understand the metaphor, yeah. Hey, oh, well. And what about the stone that fell from heaven? That's what? another thing. That's another thing. Uh, uh, That's another thing. <clears throat> okay, 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 okay. No, but um, so basically, basically to explain it to us, lot just the way he's done it in the Quran, Allah's got hands, Allah's got feet, Allah's got eyes. Is basically as a metaphor to make us understand. So he's he's the the, the ex-Muslim proud is he's not misquoting the text. It's just about understanding it. That's correct. That's correct. Kalam, can I say something quickly? Go ahead, family. And this, and this is why I said you yeah, from the very beginning, yeah, um, what, what we need to understand here, what, what the brother Kala was so simply reading, which everybody could understand, yeah? Any, anyone coming from a religious background knows, yeah, God is not going to come down and show you all the things that we now know. God is not going to physically come down and show you all the things that we now know. So, saying that meaning, we had to learn yeah, God had to show us all these things, yeah, from the religious mindset. God had to show us all these things in his creation, in nature, because he himself is not going to come down and show you all these things. Hence why, you know, you have people saying that God brought down the messages to show you 
you know, da, 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 da. you have nature as well that shows you about uh, God and, and how we are. Do you know what I mean? You show, you can see God's characteristics and his attributes in nature. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, going back to ex-Muslim, yeah, this is why I said we should have just left him with the whole Moses situation with Genesis. Because look, I already, I already said to him, yeah, that the first five books, according to him, yeah, uh, was accredited by Moses. That's dealing with the creation, which Kalam, which, which we're talking about here, the creation story of everything. Mm -hmm. And it was accredited by Moses. So he would say, he would agree on. Now, I also said to him, in his scripture, it says that Moses was educated by the Egyptians, who are the Kemites. Let's just say the Kemites, yeah? He was educated by them and was mighty in words and in deeds and in wisdom, yeah? For mm -hmm. almost 40 years. Now, the question I said to the brother was to go and find out what he learned for almost 40 years by the so-called pagan Egyptian Kemites. What did he learn? What stories did they tell? What natural things did they talk about? What, what, what creation stories did they have? And you see what I'm saying? Because once he understands and once he can tell me what it is he learned, then we can get into the discussion. But until he can tell us, what the father of the first five books, i.e. one of them being the creation story, yeah? And until he can tell us what he learnt by the so-called Kemites, this discussion, what he's saying, doesn't make no sense. So him saying, how can it be this? How can it be that? No, it's not the same. It's irrelevant, bro. Go and find out what Moses learnt, because this is where we get the creation story from, yeah? Go and find out what he learnt. Go and look, at, look, look into the Kemite history, and their creation stories then you might get a little idea of what moses might have learned and why you might see certain similarities until then all this what we're doing right now is just tip for tat this and that uh, da, 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 da. this is why i said to the brother slow down go and take time because you know you heard him say it yesterday he said he doesn't know what he learned so therefore go and do your due diligence and find out what he learned that's it case closed indeed uh. No, I, in terms of metaphors, I totally understand that, man. In terms of the whole, I thought, um, brother, um, the ex-Muslim brother, I thought he just made the quote up. But obviously, if you're naturally, like you're saying, Kalam, oh, using that for God, of course, in the beginning, you're not going to understand it. And you think, might be like, where did that come from? But if you're trying to say, look, it's not a physical person, it's purely metaphorical and allegorical to make the human mind understand it, then I, I, I could, and it's obviously an old text, isn't it? It's a very old text. So at that time, it was to make people understand. That was the most basic way to make people understand, right? Uh, Kalam, is it truly 100% metaphorical? There's no literalism to it. Okay. No, there's no literalism to this. At all. Not even anything. The reason why there is no literalism to this at all is because divine principles, okay, are literally that. They only are in the intelligible realm until you're speaking about other things such as you know bars and cars and, and bodies and so forth yeah then it doesn't enter into the physical realm so no it's a purely um uh, intelligible thing do you know what if i could um if i could draw some comparisons it, it, everything that's been discussed today um in regards to kemet it does remind me of the vedas the hindu vedas um very very similar a lot of the the Vedas and the, the stories, the Mahabharata and all the rest of it, they're not actually literal. They're just metaphors. Yeah. They're very, they're very similar. Do you know here's something very interesting, Kalam? Yeah, let me ask you something. Kalam, you know, because Kemet's one of the oldest uh, philosophies, right? Mm -hmm. So is it possible, if I'm trying to link it to a narrative of Islam, Islamic narrative, is it possible that prophets of back in the day could have potentially came to them areas and preached that one God concept um, and, you know, view via the Kemet concept, because it just sounds like Kemet's, basically the main aspect is that one God concept, right? Okay, yeah. So, um, number one, I would say that most of the Christians and most of the Muslims claim um, our sage as being one of their prophets. Okay. I'm not saying wow. that we as Kemets claim it. I'm saying that this is what the claim has been put forward. And, you know, we'll accept the claim um, as long as everybody's respectful to it. So they claim yes. that Enoch, or you would know it in your is that, tradition. Is that, is, that Hush, is that Hush Idris? Is that Idris? Yes. 
Yeah, that's Idris, okay, is the one who brought forth this, okay? So when we're reading the Hermetica, okay, and you're hearing the word Hermes, this is going back, that's the Greek understanding of who we call um, Jehuti, okay? They've ehumorized um, this principle into a physical human being, okay? And now this being has now become the prophets of the Bible and the Quran, okay? Jesus. So in the Bible, he is the one who was so highly elevated that was lifted up into the heavens and was able to speak with the gods or speak with angels or God or whatever the case is. And he passed on a lot of information to humans, okay? When you yeah. go and read the book of Enoch, he is the first one who is referred to as the Logos principle. That was the first incarnation of the logos on earth okay so for those of you guys who've got the book of enoch i'm just going to quickly show it to you like do your do your research family okay do your research anytime i, I talk i always show you lot like, evidences where you can go and you already know if i open up this book already you know it's thoroughly being read so go into the book of enoch and you'll find this in here okay You'll find the principles of Metatron. You'll find the principles of the Logos. You will literally find everything that the Christians are talking about, the Christ and so forth. Like if they read this book right here, okay, it would put their Christian doctrine into a completely different light, okay? A completely different light. So if you read that, you'll understand. So this is the the, the prophet that you lot claim as, um, so this is the individual that you lot claim as one of your prophets, and we call it Jehuti. He's the one that is the, um, you know, the author of all the divine words, i.e., the Medonetra and so forth. Um, so, 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 yeah, go on. Sorry, sorry, go on, go, bro, go, um, go, go. Um, this mirrors literally um, the mystical side of Islam, or what is not usually present in people for people like Hyde Park. You mentioned that uh, um, Idris or Enoch was raised to the heavens. There's a whole verse in the Quran which says that he was raised to a high, lofty height. Regarding the um, uh, what we read yesterday. Is um I can bring you up for you. I know in uh, Arabic we we raised into a high lofty station. Uh, but regarding uh, the text we covered yesterday, and what you mentioned today about um the using your imagination, there's a whole book in um in the Islamic spirituality regarding um this realm of similitudes. Talks about the first intellect and the sense perception, the vegetal state, the mineral state, the corporeal state, etc. A whole, it's called axiology, the epistemic axiology, as in how we know what we know. And um, basically the, um, the concept is, um, um, here, for example, we, got, we have prophets that receive visions with the sign of prophet, prophethood to actually use your abstract, um, abstract um, faculty. And it is in one of the texts, it goes, various sciences become manifest to me in corporealized form within the world of imaginalization, i.e. what we have nature in the Kemet, um, these are divine principles embodied in corporealized forms. So this is what I'd like to speak. Uh, regarding the Trinity concept and the mythos of creation, I've got you know, all these abysses of wisdom and he goes, in the divine presence, the cosmos was created, and he cites the verse of Kun for your Kun, i.e., be, and it is. And he mentions here because people, um, like Arabic, I'll state here, this is the thought, the self, the essence, the divine will, and the divine speech. And therefore, and thereafter, he mentions, were it not for the divine essence and the divine will, the, the cosmos would not have been originated. This is a myth. And uh, in the commentaries of this um, text, I've uh, got the Persian version, and he further goes on to elaborate on this using um, logic, which is in a trivium, how basic syllogistic forms, such as the modus tollens and the modus ponens, you have three premises. For example, um, every man is sentient, Socrates is sentient. I mean, sorry, every, every, Socrates is a human, therefore Socrates is a sentient being. I.e. it goes like this, if A equals B and B equals C, therefore uh, go A equals C. Using this kind, he's got many, many pages of how to go through. Wow. This is one of the set, um, ways he elucidates this concept of triplicity or trinity, you could call it, although I'm going to get what was left, right, center. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is what no, he I, I, I could go in more, but I don't want to hug the mic, so I'll pass it on. Can, no, I, can no, I ask no. a question, Kalam, if you don't? Go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> Just wanted to read something. Unless therefore a man of God, great grace, receives the power to understand what has been said and done by the prophets, the appearance of being able to repeat the words of the deeds would not profit him. 
if he cannot explain the argument of them, and he will not assuredly appear contemptible to many, since they are related by those who understand them not. On that note, that was by the early church father, Justin Martin. I wanted to ask ex-Muslim a question. Is Jesus... I knew you were going to go for me. Yes, I'm going to go for you. <laughs> here you go, that Kemet. Absolutely. And I'm obsessed. coming with my sword. So answer the question. Obsessed, man. Answer the question. Creepy. Is Jesus Christ a tranquilloquist? Does he speak outside of his body, yes or no? Does he speak outside of his body? Yes. Like when he was being baptized and a voice from heaven came and said, this is my son. Who was speaking? The father. The father, and it's not the father that was being baptized? No, it was not the father. Was being so baptized. they're two separate people then? Two separate persons, yes. Okay. So now that you're saying then, Jesus is the son of God who was baptized? Yes. Okay. That's got nothing to do with the Trinity? Yes, it does. Huh? This is the thing I'm talking about, you ex Which, yeah, To be honest, yes, this, this is, is the thing I'm talking about. Christianity is from is explaining part of the mysteries to common people. And you take common things and make mockery of it. So I'm going to make a mockery of your religion. <laughs> now, when Jesus told us to drink poison, you still haven't answered that question. Oh. Is that irresponsible or not for Jesus to tell us to drink poison? Okay. I've already answered to you. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 20 is a later interpolation <laughs> of the text and it's not part of the original <laughs> manuscript. Yes, so have you got your white coat on? Because I'm ready to take you to dinner, my friend. So you're barking up the wrong tree <laughs> like that. <laughs> well, what, what tree? Are you saying that Jesus telling us to drink poison? I'm saying you burn my dog. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this text was a later invention and interpolation, a concoction. Ah, so when you're quoting me texts like, and Paul said such and such, and he, how do I know that these are not the same interpolations? Because that's not that's not what textual criticism teaches about. Let's say Galatians chapter one verse eight. I don't even think you should go there, my friend. I don't think you should go there. Again, you're so like oh. Yeah, I know. I get up your nerves, right? Because when you see my avatar, he's just warming up. He's just warming up. When you see my avatar come on, you must have thought, ah, it's time to sleep. <laughs> Kalam's done enough. He showed you books after books after books, and all you do is ridicule. Well, he started talking about God to that masturbate. Yeah, that's very. Yeah, you talked about that. No, you spoke about that. You spoke about that. You mentioned it. That's that's what <laughs> that's what his text talk about. Yeah, and, and you know what? Like I said, I understand what Kalam meant when he was talking about it because I've read the books, but you don't understand because you're from a you're you're coming from a religious background and you're talking as if your book has no mistakes in it. Again, why do you assume that I don't understand? You're talking about Paul. I've been listening. I... And everybody knows that Paul used to take drugs. He, he used to hallucinate. Again, yeah, I, I watched some of your videos on your YouTube. Oh, did you now? And so you must bit... know I come with a sword. You're a little bit <laughs> Tell me something, my friend. No, I don't why even did want to Jesus, talk to you. Why did Jesus get you. baptized? Why, why are you talking? Get... I don't why did he get baptized? Why did he get baptized? It was God's annunciation to the world. Of Why Jesus. did Jesus get baptized? The son, of, God, the son of God needed to be annunciated. It I was thought God. baptizers were for sinners. Why did he get baptized? Again, because oh, it was God's God. annunciation to the world oh, of who okay. Jesus was. Sorry? There's a crack in your voice. It oh, was please. God's annunciation to the world of who Jesus was. That was his son. But he was a sinner. They scared the baptism. God. Wasn't he son of sinner? Why did he need it to be baptized? If he First of all, sin? Jesus says in the Gospel of John, he says, I always obey my father's listen, will. Listen, if stop he... saying what Jesus said in John, because you don't know what John you're speaking about. I'm oh, talking about the baptism. I'm talking about John's Gospel. When he was being baptized, did he sin? Yes or no? As, as I said to you, in John's Gospel, we are told that Jesus says, I always obey my Father's Why will. Why you always go then? With if these he Christians? always obeys his Father's will, that means he has never sinned. Hold on, my friend. Hold on. Is, Hold on, my friend. Hold on. Can you let you me finish? And told Kalam, 
when the book of John and Paul was written? Um, I asked you this question before. Was the book of Mark, Matthew, and Luke, which one was written before? Which one came first? The Gospel of Mark. Right. So let's stick with the book of Mark. What well, would Mark say? But that's your criterion. Where in Mark's gospel oh my say Jesus was a sinner? Does it, does it say? Keep going, Rich. Keep going. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to take my breath. It's late. But I'm going to keep up with this guy. In the book of Mark, why did Jesus get baptized? It was God's annunciation to the world of who Jesus was. That his son was a bastard. Again, then you say, oh, don't mock our religion. What a hypocrite you of are. Of course I'm going to mock yours because what, you've been sitting what, here what for the last hour and a half mocking our religion. I think the only person who is on drugs is you. Okay, well, let's okay. stick to the... Let's, enough of the civilities. Let's just answer the question. I don't even want to talk to you. Okay, you're running now. I'm not running. I just don't want to talk to pathetic people like you. Okay. Yeah, that, was a, that was a bit strong, man. Uh, the whole bastard right. bit is a bit strong, man. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, yeah, it is. It's blasphemous. When he said that masturbation, I think you that need was to... a bit strong. No, I was... Is, is I was... that part of the... the... Text though. I was, was quoting the lying or was that part of the text? But idiot. what do you call a man? What do you call a man who has no father? Yeah, no, but you know. No, I'm asking you a famous. question. Yeah, yeah, no, I know that, but you know. Again, a yeah. a bastard is is a child that is born to a mother and a father that are not married. How is that anything like that? So, what, so hold on, was Mary and God married? Pardon? Was Mary and God married? But that's not what I believe. I believe the son... No, I'm asking you a question. Stop jumping around. No, no, I'm listen, answering... Hold on. Listen, listen I'll answer... Said, you listen, just said... Listen, listen. Oh God, I'll answer it listen. the way I want to answer it. Was Mary and God married? <laughs> we believe that the Was son... Mary and God married, yes or no? That's not, I, that's, uh, that's not what I believe. But therefore, in. the criteria is wow, that Jesus... Wow, is wow, 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 Again, you can keep repeating. Oh, I've got, um, stop, stop, stop right there, Brother Rich, keep, does, it, does it say that in the text, Brother Rich? Mute out, everybody. Rich, get mute out, mute out. All right. Um, you know what? I, I think I allowed it to continue a, a bit too long, but I think the point is definitely made. I think the point is definitely made, and I don't want to um, continue going on this path on air. Maybe off here we can do this, okay? Because I've got a little... Um, unfortunately, for me, I've got a little... Um, oath to upkeep okay my oath to upkeep is to make sure that i protect and preserve um you know the scriptures and make sure they don't go into repute as such okay now i can't allow it to continue that's the only thing so unfortunately not on my watch today i, I apologize i know you lot are loving it and you lot like to get it in but i can't do it but i think hopefully um my brother rich kid has made the point okay it's made the point um you know there are sensibilities okay with your speech OK, because if you want to speak a certain way about other people's, um, you know, philosophies and come from a point of not understanding and try to belittle um, another person's uh, philosophy, um, you know, the other person or the other group could literally do the same thing with your religion or your philosophy. So that was the point that was actually, I, I think, I believe was being made. And I think it was made um, very beautifully, very perfectly as well. Now, I don't want to continue down that path because we, we're going to just stray. and I don't want us to stray um, any further. So literally don't throw stones. That's it. Don't throw stones in a glass house. Um, so, you know, let's just quickly continue with something else real quickly before we shut down. It's 3.33 in the morning. Um, you know, certain people should be in their beds right now sleeping. Yeah, you got to be up early in the morning and you lot are still here tuned in to Titans TV. Oh. God damn. And you lot haven't even hit the like button. Let me know, man. Who hasn't hit the like button? Who's got to be up for five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, but still here right now with us? You know, give me a little like. Let us know that you're here with us. And, uh, you know, support, 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 baby. Support us. Raj is in the building as well. Oh, my gosh. Asa is in the building. I know Asa would have been jumping in on this. So, again, um, just quickly, just to reiterate what we were speaking or what I was speaking about earlier on. Um, we were speaking about the, well, I was speaking about the concept of the Trinity. And, um, you know, 
I, unfortunately, I think my brother, um, ex-Muslim, is being a bit defensive. Um, you know, I'm not telling you, first of all, that your Christianity is copying. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't make the claim. You know, maybe other people might make the claim. I, I choose not to ever make those claims. I always like to be very careful with my words, just like you was being um, reckless with your words yesterday about the Quranic text. I said, nope, let me stick up for my Muslims. I, we don't make those claims around here. Um, you know, I don't make the claim that the Christians copied the Trinity from um, Kemetic text. I do not make that claim. I simply told you before that the Kemetics had their own trinity. They had various trinities. They had different types of stuff. They had triads. They had modalism. They had all sorts of sorts going on within inside of their own thing as well. And we also have a form of trinity that is very much, um, you know, similar, if not goddamn the same as the Christian um, version of the trinity. Okay. Now, if we really wanted to do a real analysis of the Christian Trinity and how it developed and, you know, the different councils that they had, that they had to work it out, we realized, this is why I don't make the claim, is because there was a process of development or developing um, the idea and of the Trinity. Not to say that the idea of the Trinity is already inside of the scriptures, but they had to develop the ideas. They had to have various um, councils to really, you know, tweak what the Trinity actually means itself. Um, so that's why I would never make the claim that the Christians copied the Kemetic Trinity. No, I don't make the claim. I simply told you before that the Christians have their own Trinity. Okay. But unfortunately, I don't know what's the problem. I think you may want to think, you know, you know, my stuff is unique. I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. Um, but yeah, um, we're going to be wrapping up. So what are we saying, Gabs? Did you want to have any words? Um, nah, man. I, I I said my piece, man. I said my piece. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, and we've also got. Let me just see. We've got my brother Mirza. Okay. I see that you've muted and unmuted your mic. Let's just see if you have any words real quickly. Uh, no, not really. Uh, perfect. All right. Perfect. Uh, who we got here? Raza. Kalam, bro, I'm, I'm, amazing show. I learned a lot today. Uh, inshallah, maybe over the, over time again, Kalam, I want you to tell me a little bit about Idris in the future, man. Ah, uh, definitely, man. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah. We'll get into cool. it. We'll get into it, man. Definitely. <clears throat> All right. Um, if anybody else has any last words, just please mute on me your mic, and then I'll get you lot to say before we close out the show. <laughs> oh, and Kalam, what else Kemetism uh, trace to? How many BC? Um, Kemetism. Okay, so. The Kemetic culture itself goes back, I think it's 3,400 BCE in wow. terms of its written um, historicity. Obviously, we do have pre-dynastic um, Kemet as well, which goes back. Oh, yeah, to that's like 7,000, right? Yeah, I think we found evidence of 12,500 BCE in the wow. British Museum. So, yeah. Is that older than Hinduism? Um, Hinduism, yeah, it's older than Hinduism, I think. Wow. But Hinduism is taken from Yazidism, and that's like 4,700 BC. Ah, uh, okay, I'm with you, I'm with you. Wow. So yeah, uh, we're talking ancient right. cultures, man. Ancient cultures, ancient civilizations, and their thought patterns that they developed throughout their years. Uh, let me get Buddha in real quickly. Yeah, just a quick um, request. Um, Ex-Muslim, next time you come on, um, can we talk about football instead, please? <laughs> Oh, yeah, no man. problem. I'm a Sunderland fan. <laughs> oh, God. Sunderland, oh. kick him off. Don't let him oh, ban wow. him. Don't ever let him come back in there again. <laughs> Mohammed Salah. That... Mohammed Salah. We went, we went from bad to worst. We went from bad to worst. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody else who hasn't actually had a say, would you like to say something before we close out? I'm giving you the opportunity right now. Yeah, Kalam, I think you said that perfectly about people don't stow, throw stones. If you're going to talk about people's religion that you don't understand, don't mock it, because we don't mock people's religion. But if you're going to mock people's religion, expect the fire. I'm listening. Mm. Mm. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy yet I have people that can bring the fire around me. Unfortunately for me, yeah, I find it very difficult because I'm not allowed to. You know the way is that? You know when you're not allowed to do those things? It's hard. Like, you want to, but you're like, how can I? How can I? I got too much respect for everything to be even doing those things. All right. Um, but salute to you for um, bringing the fire. That's why I got at times you need to have his right-hand man here that just 
raining down fire, raining down fire on everything. Um, so yeah, ex-Muslim, go ahead, King. So if you consider me quoting a text about uh, something and you consider that to be offensive, that's your problem. All I did was quote a text and then Kalam had it explained to me that it's all metaphorical. And so you're the one who's saying that I offended you. My, that was not my intention to offend anyone. I was just quoting a text and you got the impression that I was being rude. For me, it's looking at this text and you're saying that the Trinity is very similar to like the Egyptian Trinity. I, I, okay. think, I think I your think your mic is cutting out. I don't know if it's my internet or your mic that's cutting out. But I believe it's your mic that's cutting out. Um, I think the point is, yeah, there is um, you. All right. What you was doing right there. Can I just make my last point, Callum, just quickly, please? Go ahead. Okay, my point is I think you should be able to emphasize and realize because apart, I don't understand how um, the Egyptian gods work and how their utilization of metaphors and personifications. I think you should emphasize that anyone reading this on the surface level would be simply shocked that yeah. someone who comes from a Trinitarian understanding and then looking at this text where it's talk about masturbation and uh, uh, and spitting out a god and things like this, it could be quite a shock and uh, I find it quite incredible how this can be likened to the doctrine of the Trinity. So I think you should be more empathetic and not say, oh, he's being rude and things like that. So, yes, I am pretty much empathetic, hence the reason you never got uh, blocked or ejected from the conversation. I fully understand the paradigm that you're coming from and the lens that you're looking throughout, looking at the world throughout. So hence the reason why I have a lot of um, patience with a lot of people, because I understand where they're coming from. OK, and this is why I kept saying to you, um, I would love for you, if you are really sincere, is to just take off, take off the Christian lens for a hot second. OK, and read African philosophy from an African philosophy standpoint. Don't once worry, Colin, to, I will do exactly yeah. that. Once you're, yeah, once you're able to understand it, you can understand the mentality. And by the way, rich kid needs to start drinking some more chamomile. All right. <laughs> So once, and I'm saying this to everybody, okay, um, you know, try your very best. I like, I mean, personally, I do my very best to, when I'm speaking with people, okay, and I'm speaking, for example, I speak to my Salafi brothers, what do I do? I simply go in, I read their, their, um, their Wahhabi text, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab text. I go and mm. I read their, um, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah text and so forth. So mm. I can fully understand where they're coming from. And I categorize that. I put that in one section of my mind. This is how my um, Sunni or my Salafi brothers think. Then I've got my novel folder, my Shia folder, where I've got Kafi mm. and, and other uh, books like that and some older books that I've even been mentioned to Raza as well. So I understand yeah. where your brothers are coming from and I can think from that paradigm. Then I can go into Christianity and so forth. So, you know, be considerate and be able to think how your, your other um, family members think. Hence the reason why. Um, personally, I don't mock other people's religions or say certain things that might be too offensive to them because I understand the way that they think. I understand what's what's um, you know the sensibilities to do with their religion or their philosophy or their thought pattern. You know, we have to be more considerate and be in a world of harmony with each other and not um, you know do things out of maliciousness and spite. Because if we you know even I know that if I start saying things like that about your deity, whatever the case is, you're gonna find it highly offensive. OK, highly offensive. So I choose not to utilize my, my my speech in certain ways because I understand where everybody's coming from. And I hope that the world as well, like everybody who's listening in, try to be understanding of other people's philosophies. I hear it all the time. It's because corner. Oh, you're Hindu. You worship cows. And I'm like, freaking hell, man. Is this is this is the level that don't, we're going don't, to? Don't simplify. It. Yeah, don't simplify things to that level where you just can abuse someone so quickly because you can't just be like, oh, you were. Like you might not agree with it, but you've got to get, you know, I'm sure their theology is deeper than just worshiping a cow, right? Exactly. Exactly that. So, um, you know, allow it. And that's why I'm um, speaking, sorry, Titans TV or Talk with the Titans is literally built. Like we literally bring everybody on. We want the Hindus to come on and explain. You know, we have Farhan Qureshi coming on and breaking down his, you know, his philosophy. We have Sikhis coming on like um, Harry and other people, um, Singh, Agam and so forth. here coming in and breaking down their philosophy. So we have a deeper understanding and appreciation for it. We have my atheist brothers coming on so we could understand their worldview. Because I ain't going to lie, like growing up, if someone said that they were atheists, like it's like, 
Like you're, it's like you're literally looking at the devil in their face right now. Yeah. Like, the hell was wrong with you? Type of thing. Like you, you, <laughs> you don't even want to associate with those people. Mm -hmm. All those ways there. But this is what it's for. This is what these platforms are for to, you know, broaden your your expanse of knowledge and, and understanding of other people's cultures as well. You know, Jews as well. Like I remember, you know, seeing people coming first <laughs> the corner. And they're speaking to Jews because based upon all their preconceptualizations of Jews and so forth. But I ain't gonna lie to you, like I'm so I'm friend, like but, like trust me, like but like Nostan and them and there, yeah. It's like yo, they're the safest people ever. I would sit down with them all day long over other people because they are talking sense and they are so on the next level, a way of thinking. So it's really good. Like I've broken a lot of my, me personally, I've broken a lot of barriers, you know, um, you know, joining the speakers corner community, joining the talk with the Titans community, because I have the ability to actually speak with, you know, so many different people from so many different backgrounds, from so many different ideologies. It's absolutely amazing. You know, we can get along with everybody once we have an understanding of where people are coming from. Um, mm. So yeah, I'm trying to close out, man. I'm trying to close out. Like, please. Yo, can before. I? What about 10 explaining Buddhism? Yeah, mm. like what I'm saying, I need Buddha Bing to come on to drop some some heat on that, okay? Like, like me personally, I try my very best not to speak on certain topics. Like I have done yeah. my studies on certain topics, but I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. Why, why should I be representing, you know, a Sikh or representing a Buddhist or something like that? Like it's, it needs a Buddhist or somebody coming from that paradigm to come on and really, you know, say the thing, like break down the knowledge. So I would love for my um, Buddhist brothers to come on or sisters to come on. I would love for my Yazidi brothers and sisters to come on, my Zoroastrians to come on and break down some knowledge, man. This will be... Yeah, let me know when you're ready and I'll trample trust, sound together. Trust me. We're in context. We've got the emails going. So yeah, we'll do this. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to close down the show. Okay. It's like literally 10 quarter to four right now. And I'm mad tired, baby. I'm mad tired. Okay. And again, Bro, the shows are getting keep uh, shows are getting keep longer. Exactly. I don't know. I don't, I'm not even gonna stay up to try to break down this show into halves or, or threes. I'm just gonna have to let the show be, man. Let the show be. Um, so some of you guys should be in your beds right now, sleeping. Yeah, it's almost four o'clock in the morning. It's going like you don't have no work in the morning, you don't have no children, you don't have nowhere to go, or you don't want to do. <laughs> Be here with talk with the Titans, talk, talk, talk with the Titans. So salute to everybody um, who's tuned in. We're actually going to be breaking down a lot of the comedic stuff um, more and more to you guys. We're going through um, the Hermetica, okay? We're going through the Hermetica. We broke down um, some of the Hermetica yesterday, and we touched upon it again today, earlier on, and we're going to continue breaking down some Hermetica um, for as long as it takes to actually break down the 10 uh it's like literally 10 pages 10 pages of the hermetica i think we're just on page two from yesterday just on page two from yesterday we're going to try to break it all down for you guys so you can understand and um when i say it is the best text um for the western mind okay it bridges you into the comedic philosophy because if we really started going into you know the deeper comedic philosophy and i started showing you I was about to pull, pull down some text, you know, I was literally looking up some text right now where we're seeing straight hieroglyphs. I know everybody here would be lost and I, and I don't want to be speaking no hieroglyphs <laughs> to nobody. And I've only got like two people in here like, yeah, I know yeah, that, that those two people will be like Asar and somebody else who understands the comedic um, hieroglyphs. I don't want to go that deep. So I just want to go on a surface level that everybody can just kind of understand and gain a, an understanding and appreciation for it and not too deep. So yeah, buddy. Um, let me close down the show now because I'm too tired and I might be rambling. So yeah, young, 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 young Cali baby, can't wait. Young, 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 young Cali baby, can't wait. Yo, family tree. Okay, tomorrow, 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 I will see you guys on the other side. I think over here we're gonna continue a little bit longer. But peace, salute. I'm out, and um, yeah, make sure you just take care of one of one of another and love each other, man. Peace. We're out.